Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a decent day and welcome back to another episode of the Progressive World Podcast. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Sam. So here's a quick, brief rundown of the show. We're going to start with the UK, where the CIA was plotting to perhaps kidnap and assassinate Julian Assange. We're going to talk about that expose. Then move on to the ongoing fuel crisis and fuel hoarding in the UK, as well as some other UK stories. Then Sam is going to tell us a little bit about the Australian Prime Minister's climate and record and the fact that he won't be going to the upcoming climate summit in Scotland. Then we're going to talk about the the German elections. So the Social Democrats technically won and we're going to unpack the election. It's quite complicated. It might take We'll unpack to a certain extent. I see Sam shaking his head there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, it's going to take months for them to form a government, apparently. But the Greens could very possibly be part of the government, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll talk about all that. Then we'll move to the Middle East and Israel's speech at the UN and some Israel-Iran news. Before <clears throat> finishing up with our country briefs with an Afghanistan update and also some news on North Korea and the U.S., And then we're going to move on to Progressive World Online, talk about Dylan Radigan's interview on Breaking Points. Uh, Sorry, yeah, on Breaking Points. Then Breaking Points also had a segment on Elizabeth Holmes, the founder and CEO of Theranos. And we've never talked about that and, you know, find it to be a fun story. So we'll talk about that a little bit and then finish up with some progressive tweets. So that's more or less the rundown. As always, you can find timestamps below so you can jump to your favorite Part. And if you've been watching this show for a bit, consider not only liking, but subscribing as well. But okay, Sam, are you ready? Should I start with the Julian Assange news? Yeah, please do so. Yeah, so this expose, which was published in Yahoo News, apparently, I didn't know that they did like original work, but two or three. Yeah, well, go ahead. Just a shout out. Actually, Yahoo News surprisingly like i found out through my dad because he had yahoo news somehow like set up on his uh, computer or i believe on his uh, tablet uh, like they do really good stuff especially yahoo finance and yeah. Uh, yeah they they like they have these weird and it was really weird they have like britney spears latest i don't know celebrity thingy and then next to it like financial situation in taiwan and the next <laughs> like cycle of boom and yeah. bust in Indian in in the Pacific region, it's like really weird mixture, but they do great. But weird I didn't know that they make like good original content because I go on Yahoo News, but it's just like a lot of articles that oh. they've bought from other places, like AP, ah. and then some like strange Christian ones. <laughs> Sometimes a different <laughs> one, but you never know with Yahoo. Okay. You know what they get like sold and bought like every few yeah. years. <laughs> so <laughs> so they're just hanging really? on. I've... Yeah, yeah. I had. Uh... Based is on anybody what I know. using Yahoo as a search engine? Are they still a search engine? I mean, I think their like website with Yahoo News is probably one of their most more popular like remaining products. But right. sorry okay. about the yeah. tangent. No. <laughs> so <clears throat> so yeah, so Yahoo News published this expose, which pretty much in it details the CIA's alleged plans to kidnap and possibly kill Julian Assange around 2017, so in the early days of the Trump administration. So in 2017, as Julian Assange began his fifth year in Ecuador's embassy in London, the CIA (coughs) plotted to kidnap the WikiLeaks founder, spurring heated debate among Trump administration officials over the legality and practicality of such an operation. So apparently, Mike Pompeo, during that time, he was the head of the CIA, and WikiLeaks had gotten hold of some documents from some leaks from the CIA that had pissed off the CIA even more. So they were, can you hear me? I'm getting like weird feedback and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no my microphone is fine. doing. But yeah, sorry about that. Is it but, maybe my, my mobile phone, if I use, I'm going oh, through your notes. Perhaps, I don't Should know. I turn? But now it's all right, good let me anyway. Turn, turn off. I don't need the. All right. 
<clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. So I mean, apparently Mike Pompeo and the CIA were, you know, extra pissed. I mean, they extra hated WikiLeaks at this time. It's because they always hated them. So yeah, they were actually thinking of ways of how to kidnap and kill him. And apparently they went as far as drawing some scenarios. And this was leaking between all kinds of different um, intelligence from different countries. So I have a few, one or two quotes that I wanted to read from. It's a long expose and it's pretty funny. But apparently at one time, the U.S. started to think that Assange wanted to move or that the Russians wanted to move Assange to Moscow, either to like the Ecuadorian embassy in Moscow or just take him to Moscow, right? <clears throat> so they thought that this was going to happen, right? So this is a quote from the article. In response... The CIA and the White House began preparing for a number of scenarios to foil Assange's Russian departure plans. Those included potential gun battles with Kremlin operatives on the streets of London, crashing a car into a Russian diplomatic vehicle transporting Assange and then grabbing him, and shooting out the tires of a Russian plane carrying Assange before he could take off for Moscow. Apparently, U.S. officials had asked the British counterparts to do the shooting if gunfire was required, and the British agreed, according to a former senior administration official. And so before I read the next quote, by the way, this story is based on oh, um, conversations with 30 former U.S. officials. So this expose is apparently, yeah. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And this is not fiction, by the way. <laughs> No, I know, but I was wondering <laughs> if the the people who were planning this uh, were they by any chance also the writers of the latest Fast and Furious movies? Or I think so. It's the same. That, uh, <laughs> Have you heard of the CIA? Uh, <laughs> CIA Hollywood okay. revolving so, door. They just go in and out. Yeah, like. yeah. CIA and Fast and Universal <laughs> Pictures. Yeah, yeah. So we get the Rock to, yeah. you know, grab a helicopter with one of his hands and then grab a truck. What? I'm okay but but to be I mean, honest you know, I do have a I, I kind of want to I mean it's not a criticism of this report but I do want to add a caveat at the end when you're done sorry yeah I mean you know I'm guessing that like this is how you're supposed to interpret this there's a bunch of guys in the CIA who were like pissed off and Mike Pimple was pissed off and they were just probably wanting to kidnap and assassinate Assange and at the same time just talking so much crap I mean there's no way you would no way like you think a CIA agent would take such things seriously, you know. I mean, crashing well, into yeah. a Russian you diplomatic finish. vehicle would be insane. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'll, but yeah, I'll possible, give you my possible. Take at the end. Yeah, let me just no, read no, one more. Yeah. So it's a wrong. It's a long expose, but I just took two. So, um, let me read another quote here. The intrigue over a potential Assange escape set off a wild scramble among rival spy services in London. American, British, and Russian agencies, among others, stationed undercover operatives around the Ecuadorian embassy. In the Russians' case, it was to facilitate a breakout. For the U.S. and Allied services, it was to block such an escape. <clears throat> it was beyond comical, said the former senior official. I like this point. It got to the point where every human being in a three-block radius was working for one of the intelligence services, whether they were street sweepers or police officers or security guards. So, yeah. Does it, <laughs> spec Does yeah. it specify which intelligence services? It said just no. I mean, it said CIA. So no, it only it said MI Russian agencies. I mean, MI six or something. What? Sorry, I'm guessing CIA, MI six, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't know NSA, Interpol. I, 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 I just, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's not very <clears throat> I don't know. crucial. I would say. To I the wondered. Story. No, I, I think it, in a way it is because well, um, anyway. Uh, are you done with the whole... Uh, yeah, yeah, those were the kind of quotes. And yeah, The Hill and Ryan Grimm, they had a good section. I listened to it. I listened to it there. They had a journalist if people want to check it out. Well, did they uh, break down the report or they... What was it? Kind they of, just introduced it. No, no they <laughs> kind of have a 13-minute segment on it with a journalist. So he said some of the stuff that I All said, right. some different things, I'm sure. Oh, cool. I'll... Cheers. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, <clears throat> I wanna. I wanted to add some caveat because I think 
<coughs> I don't want to minimize this story because I think Julian Assange is, I mean, if you've had this discussion before, like I don't like these words hero and stuff, but if like anybody's close to like being inspirational and actually like uh, standing for what they believe in, it seems he's one of the few people that is uh, quite literally is paying. I mean, there's lo lots of people, especially in the third world and a lot of places which we never hear about and uh, stuff, but, uh, but just in, as somebody in a public eye, he seems genuinely to be one of the most, uh, I think, in my view, inspirational people out there. But I do think this is, <clears throat> I think a lot of this is a bit of a hot air in, in terms of like a lot of these uh, intelligence agencies uh, have to basically justify their existence. I mean, this is one of the major themes, especially po in the post-Soviet uh, world, because I don't think any of them seriously, I, I think some of them, as you said, uh, want, wanted revenge against Assange because they hate him so much. Yeah, I mean, that uh, is, I think to be fair, like sorry. More, more, pe just people more like Michael Flynn, actually, more so than Mike Pompeo. I think Mike Pompeo is a bit, a, a bit more opportunist than just the neocon, you know, type thing. But I mean, the, I, I was sorry. telling you what the story is, um, is kind of yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. And so Same, they yeah. talk about a Vault 7, that's what it's referred to. So Vault 7 was like these, uh, which included these documents that they sent. So they're saying, yeah, they were extra pissed about that, the CIA and M Mike Pompeo, so wanting to, you know, get back at Assange. But I mean, I totally agree that, you know, of course, the CIA and so does like generals and the army and the war industry make up reasons and create reasons for their existence. So, oh, and, no, no, that's for sure. That, besides that, I don't, I don't mean just that uh, you are completely right there. But for example, it's so easy, for example, for my, Mike Pompeo, which in my view is such a cynical character because he's belongs to Christian evangelist like uh, segment as well. And uh, I, I don't know, it's just, uh, like as a politician and a Christian evangelist, I, I, it's just, he, he's such a hypocrite in many ways. Anyway, I, 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 I mean, I'm critical of Christianity, but there, I don't think his politics reflect Christian values in any way shape or form yeah i doubt it <laughs> uh, but uh, so so he's a he's a complete hypocrite so i think it's such an easy way for them to you know uh, as, as a sort of way to a macho sort of establishing their authorities so, okay we're going to bring down assange this uh, one man army who uh, through his uh, sort of uh, ingenuity had had managed to basically uh, you know damage us you know i'm going to go after him instead of you know actually uh, you know, doing anything substantial that is actually going to raise the security of the country. So I think there is a big element of that because he's just such an easy target. And uh, yeah, it, it's hot air in that sense. I don't mean the reporting is uh, bullshit. I'm uh, saying that uh, all these plans they made, I think a lot of them, they knew that this bullshit plans couldn't go through but you have to you know justify your time but i mean they office. do that for everything so you came though. i mean up... the cia probably does with everything I yeah mean, yeah of course clearly. yeah of yeah course. Uh, i mean yeah have you i you mean can say uh, you, you, i don't know if you've read or heard about the plans they had to assassinate uh, uh fidel castro some of them which they tried mm. like ludicrous idiotic yeah. like you know uh so yeah i i think some of them it are just excuses to just fill in office time, you know. Just yeah, no, no, for sure. No maybe. more. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that makes sense. Of course, they wanted to have him. They would love to, you know, if they could to have him killed or like capture him or something. That would have been big for them, of course. But then, yeah, it just turns into. That's what I also kind of meant, you know. I said like, you know. Uh, yeah, and I mean, it's so crazy that apparently it's White House officials who kind of put an end. That's how crazy apparently, you know, these, I mean, not apparently, these ideas that you heard are. So exactly. Yeah, and then, yeah, man, and then, uh, Michael Flynn, who I think is also mentioned in this report, Michael Flynn was involved in this plot to like uh, kidnap uh, Fatullah Golan, who's like an opposition leader 
uh, from Turkey living in the US. Like these people are quite, you know, like especially Trump, like people who Trump came yeah. with himself to office. They, I, they, I mean, because especially they didn't expect to win. Uh, it's just they like they're not very bright let's say yeah not the sh- sharpest knives you know not the sharpest tools in the drawer <clears throat> yeah but okay so just to wrap up this story and as so as everybody knows julian Assange right now is in prison and he's like this close from freedom like all needs to happen is for biden administration to not decide not to appeal and then it's well, all they over. Did that feel. Yeah, or no, like to withdraw still, or the, to Draw, withdraw anything. It. Yeah, drop the appeal. That that's all it needed. And this evidence. So you know they were talking about whether you know the fact that you would be sending the U.S. to back to a country, sending sorry Assange to a country where they tried to kill him, but apparently like the judge, this this evidence will not be considered by the judge for X or Y reason. You know, court systems are. Are, I mean, are complicated yeah. but i mean if yeah. the story existed in the past it could have been utilized no does, the judge does, already I, blocked I, the judge already blocked him from going there because um he or she said that you know uh, the, he would commit suicide potential. there possibly yeah so no, uh, you do know that you does, win over with weird arguments <laughs> like kind of no, no, no. sure but does the story have any um emails any internal communications or is it um, just those true, 34 if, uh, officials? Yeah, I don't know. That's because a good question. Yeah, Because th- if it's just hear- hearsay, yeah. then legally, I don't think they Yeah, no, any, no, you're like, right. Put- but but maybe there are documents I think, to show or something. I mean, I think or, we, yeah. we can make judgment for ourselves, but legally speaking. No, you're absolutely right there. That's, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think there are. Oftentimes you can find some stuff after, but yeah, um, very good point. That actually kind of relates to the whole Elizabeth Holmes story that um, we'll get to. And yeah, also, yeah, (laughs) to sue someone and stuff, you kind of have to get into like, yeah, you need to know that the reasons why they committed all this and for sure and all that. But okay, that's it with this uh, Julian Assange um, story here. So let's move on. But staying with the UK. So, Sam, what do we have next? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so with the kid, there, there was a couple of developments which I like to uh, focus on, basically. Uh, first of all, we had a, uh, we, we discussed uh, the gas crisis that UK is going through, which is mainly affecting gas companies in the UK uh, recently, right? Uh, and in that, I briefly mentioned that there is this thing with large drivers and all that, but at the time, I wasn't quite aware of the situation. But the situation has significantly evolved and now there is a whole fuel <clears throat> you could argue fuel shortage crisis going on in the uk uh, there are long queues uh, for uh, uh, fuel for uh, for petrol there has been even uh, a few cases of i think media obviously exaggerates but there has been few cases of fights uh, broken out between people yeah. waiting in long lines for petrol sorry but- no, no, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you in the middle. Continue. No, no. Uh, <clears throat> and that is, and uh, the issue is uh, very, <clears throat> excuse me, today my voice is a bit of a crazy thing. The issue has become uh, very political in a sense. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> not two major reasons have been given for, for uh, th- this crisis. Uh, one, uh, is the f- fact that UK is no longer part of European Union and lorry drivers, significant numbers of them were of uh, European... Uh, and, uh, this, and that's sorry. relevant because the lorry drivers would, would have been the ones bringing the fuel to the gas stations, right? That is, yes, that, and that is why they're connected. <clears throat> so so, yes, the, and right so now, the fuel, the uh, gas is somewhere. It's just not reaching the gas stations currently. The, the petrol yeah the petrol. That, that's true I should I should have clarified and uh, gra- gra- grand chaps chaps whom uh, I have a uh, like there can be no more person I think I hate in the world but anyways he wrote self-help books on their different name and ha- now he's a minister of for fucks mm. anyway <clears throat> anyways he that's true 
there is no fuel shortage in the UK per se. The problem is that uh, there is not enough lorry drivers uh, uh, take, uh, at least that's what the UK government claims. There is no fuel shortage. There is not enough uh, lorry drivers and lorries to deliver them to uh, uh, to the gas station. Stations, and now right? people have freaked out and they've gone and just filled yes, up their cars, just kind of with the buying. beginning. I mean, just like with the toilet papers in the beginning of and, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and you have a couple of feet. And a couple of weeks ago, shelves were going empty in the UK supermarkets. So, uh, okay, so some people are saying that this is because of Brexit, uh, uh, and that's the main reason. Uh, that's causing problems with the supply chain, and that's causing problems with the labor mm-hmm. force. And there is co- some evidence to support that. For example, a lot of uh, uh, companies people who own company of, you know, lorry companies, they said they are in contact with their former employees who've moved back to their uh, yeah. country of origins. And they say they want to come back, but because of visa situation and all that, they can't. There were a couple of polls that showed 60% of uh, lorry drivers believe that Brexit played a role uh, in that. Yeah, and sorry. But, uh, that, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, so I was just thinking for like some of our maybe US audience, I mean, it is a little bit obvious, but yeah, before Brexit, Europeans, you know, could just go live in the in the UK, just live there and then get a job if they could, they had a job and then, you know, they didn't have a job, they could just live there. But now, I mean, for a European to come to the UK, they would have to have a job in advance and everything and only to do it through their employment. So that's the big dynamic, right? That in this story, they're saying Brexit has changed. So now they would have to bring, you know, drivers very in an official way for the duration of a contract and everything. So it's not that appealing to a lot of Europeans. Uh, but, sure. Yeah. And the process, I mean, it's a, that's, that's what I'm going to get to because that's one narrative right now going mm-hmm. on in media. The other narrative by more conservative, let's say right wing, pro-Brexit people, is that, that <clears throat> no, this is an issue with the fact that we don't have a trained workforce. Mm-hmm. No, this is an issue with the fact that we don't have, we don't pay our lorry drivers enough. For example, I saw an interview in which a lorry driver pointed out that for getting a license and getting the tr- necessary training and all that, you need to spend about 5,000 uh, pounds over the course of like, let's say a year. Uh, to become a large driver and then get paid 15, 12 to 15 pounds per hour. So For a tough young people job. don't, <laughs> it's a, a, yeah, tough job. Apparently though, very popular job. Uh, I'll get to that. Uh, apparently there is a whole culture associated with it and lots of that people love that yeah. sort of thing. Uh, so uh, there is that. And to, like Ian Duncan, a Smith, former conservative leader whom, uh, I mean, they are Tories. I don't agree with anything they say, really. But by the way, that's what, like, this is one nation conservatism in a way. Like, he was, in a way, he, I like that he came on TV and said, well, when you have a problem like this, that, that you don't have enough workers for a job, the, the clear solution is that you have to pay the, those workers more or improve their working conditions, and then you attract more people to do those jobs. So, I think that's a fair point too. Not to say that Brexit didn't have anything yeah. to do with this. I think both so, narratives make sense. It sounds like a combination of both. Sure, but I I don't like that. Again, I I mean I wasn't a big supporter of Brexit or staying in the EU. I didn't think it mattered that much. As time went on, I became a slightly more in favor of Brexit, to be honest, because of especially the way. Brexiteers were treated and all that, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think when you have such a shift in your political economy, these supply issues, these market issues, first of all, are are unavoidable. Second of all, the blame lies with. I mean, we Brexit ha- has been happening for such a long time. And these people that in Guardian, in all these places, I read about these news and the way they cover it is still like they're hoping for like a return <laughs> yeah. to a, 
uh, to a, like uh, another people's vote or something. Uh, yeah. It's over. It's done. So we should be focusing on why the fuck the government or the civil service or whoever has not uh, from six months ago planned Address for this. such an easy problem, you know? such a minor exactly. problem. I mean, if this exactly. is the worst <laughs> outcome of Brexit, I mean... <laughs> Exactly, because because right now they're, for example, issuing emergency visas for yeah. lorry dri- for people who could be lorry drivers. Even that's going to take a couple of months, by the way. So, like these things could have been thought through, yeah. even if you disagree with Brexit, which I completely understand. But it it's been happening like we at least for the last year, it's been a hundred percent happening. So yeah. there is no reason for this chaotic uh, like this is a clear failure uh ma- management failure yeah this is like and a governance way, issue but yeah yeah and a but uh, just one. to cl- just to clarify what i mean by uh w- w- what i mean by media reports that i despise uh, for example i don't know if anybody saw that but all of schultz was actually asked about this the we the sort of presumed winner of German elections. We talk about that later. He was asked about this uh, by the Channel 4 news reporter. And he said two things. He said that, well, Britain is not part of freedom of the movements anymore. And that's, you know, probably going to affect these type of things. Secondly, also, if you have a, you know, job like truck drivers, which is quite attractive to some people, but you don't have enough people doing that job, you have to probably look at that working conditions and improve that working conditions. So he basically mentioned the two factors that we just mentioned, correct? Yeah. Am I? Yeah, no, uh, no. People You're should accurate. watch that video for themselves. Maybe I'm... Now, look at the way <clears throat> a Guardian reported it. Uh, I hope I don't mistake Guardian for another news outlet <laughs> like last time. But anyway, uh, uh, Guardian reported it as end to freedom of movement behind UK fuel crisis, says Merkel's likely successor. Uh-huh. Olaf Schultz, poised to become next chancellor, wades into a row over HGV uh, driver shortage. You see, uh-huh. and by the way, most people don't read uh, full articles and all that. Uh, so you know that that's what I mean. I hate yeah, yeah. About the politicization of the, uh, uh, the these type of debates because, as you said, probably all these factors play the role. I yeah, think. no, no, no. Those headlines. I mean, it's just typical, typical type of media headlines. Those ways. Uh, center lefty, centery. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, typical. But I mean, yeah, guy. I mean, this is technically speaking a much smaller problem than the gas crisis, which we talked about the other day, which is going to take um, uh, probably, probably a few months to be solved, really. And it's going to be cost, and gas is going to cost more. And, yeah, and g- gas that. crisis is more of a crisis of for the system, yeah, so to speak. But this fuel crisis is affecting daily lives. Yeah, and that's life. the thing. So, yeah, and people are uh, going to the gas you know, stations and long queues. And yeah, I mean, I saw a crazy. I think the article that you sent me said just the headline. What did it say? Like, you're right with the numbers. I got it right here. Up to 90% of UK petrol pumps dry amid panic buying. So, yeah. But you oh, know, yeah, the, yes. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, there will be a limited. That was another thing. There will be a limited uh, military is going to get involved, basically, yeah, yeah. and a couple of uh, trucks or uh, lorries. I don't know what whether yeah. they are uh, tankers. Tankers, I believe, of militaries go- are going to be uh, deployed to help to ease the situation. Man, did I tell you this? But like during in the beginning of the coronavirus, like um, one of the one of the employees at the supermarket told me this. But like as soon as people were always like pointing they were like oh look there are no more toilet papers oh my god and like it was just like because people were buying them so fast they just didn't have time to go in the back get some more and like reshelf them so it just it reminds me a little bit of that i think that people that being scared of a the shortage case in 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 some cases but i think in some cases there were shortages 
I mean, pretty much like logistic shortages, like pretty much. I mean, there was at one point where you couldn't buy more than one toilet paper and all that, I remember. But all that was created of the hoarding. Like the the supply process for toilet papers wasn't affected um, heavily at all or anything. It's just the way people reacted and everything. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. it messed up. Yeah, I remember at one point, you're right. I completely forgot you could buy one pack of toilet paper this lasted for oh, really? a few weeks or something well, i'm vaguely remembering now it's kind of distant memory now but yeah uh, the one thing i would say is both this fuel crisis in uk and the covid crisis with toilet papers and supply chain <laughs> issues that the, the videos and images we saw in uk and us i would say like you know it is so funny that like some i hope nobody's offended because most of our viewers don't even fit in this category but some people view the western like culture as this like more edge like more yeah of course uh, that's the whole dynamic it is really advanced it is, it civilized is, of course I mean, clashes of the civilizations i mean no, no. I mean, forget about clash of civilizations. Yeah. Just like in Turkey or in Iran or, or India, or maybe in, I don't know enough about India, but in these countries, you cannot, like they would die, like if there is a last toilet paper, they would <laughs> die before like, no, please, you have to take <laughs> this. You need it more than oh, I do. Okay, like, in that it, sense. It, it's just that, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. no, not just in that, it's just the idea to fight over toilet paper or like, uh, I'm sorry, but it was pathetic like it was for uh, for people at that level of comfort and uh you know uh yeah. bourgeois living it was pathetic yeah. it was and just like you could it was just like it was so funny to me it was just uh, anyway it was very and funny. the funny thing is that it's like i mean i know that in western world it's considered an essential product <laughs> But around oh, the but world, yes. in many places, it's not even a we central have product. So yeah. <laughs> technically yeah. speaking, if like <laughs> there were no more toilet papers, they shouldn't have caused that much an issue. Now, when people bought the pasta and the canned beans, that makes a little bit more All sense. Right. Oh, yeah, that the pasta shells sense. were empty, too. That made right. at least... <laughs> that's an yeah, essential. That's, that's... But okay, so I would let's say no, no, toilet. Uh, if, wait, you, if you don't if, keep no, this no, wait, going. If, you don't have, if you don't have bidet or something, I would yeah. say toilet paper is essential. But Listen, anyway, there are there are creative solutions out there. <laughs> especially if you're having canned beans. So no, that's a myth too. Okay, let's um let's move on. Let's go to yeah. all right. Let's focus on the other. Sorry about the tangents. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's focus on the labor. So uh, we, we discussed the labor conference and sat, I, I, I made a mistake and I should apologize. I said that labor uh, stammer. I mean, I'm going to read the thing. Uh, this was BBC. Sir Keir Starmer uh, forced to drop leadership rule change. And again, like an idiot, uh, I didn't read the, you know, fine details. But hold on, just remind people who he is and everything, especially the U.S. audience in case. Oh, sorry. Keir Sarmer, uh, the leader of Labour Party, the left party in the U.K. I think they like because of Tony Blair and all that. No, I mean, because of if it was Jeremy Corbyn, of course, everybody would know. But this guy, he's still quite a bit obscure. I mean, Keir Sarmer internationally. Yeah. Thankfully, a man, <laughs> I'm not, a I'm man, not complaining. Yeah. No, no, you're right. He has been mistaken for a yeah. uh, you know, piece of furniture a couple of times. So, you know, but uh, uh, anyways, they, they, that was the, that was literally, I just quoted the BBC headline. I didn't read the article, sadly. Uh, again, a mistake you should never do. Uh, they didn't uh, uh, drop the leadership rule changes. They watered them down. And sadly, on the conference floor, even though there are lots of great videos of the conference floor, floor on, in Brighton, people attacking uh, the leadership rule changes in a very passionate and, in my view, in a very uh, substantive way. They talk about the way, uh, for example, how minorities and uh, women would have been f- even further excluded if these 
if rules but sorry like can you that, just take one step back in case people didn't watch the previous episode just take one step back and in one minute sure. explain what Keir Starmer wanted to do sure so okay let's take two step back in 2000 I believe 13 or 14 labor changed its leadership rules to uh, one member one vote instead of an electoral college that would have given members of parliament one third of the overall vote right so members of the parliament were 100 to let's say 200 people depending on the uh, election uh, thingy uh, results uh, they would have had one third of the value of the whole votes when it came to electing a leader right and then there are all these other uh, tiny uh, other rules about like threshold like mm -hmm. you need 10 percent you need that 10 percent of the uh, labor uh, members of the parliament to uh, like support you to be able to stand for so the they did away right? with all of that not with all of that but they more. reduced the threshold and they did have one member one vote so like a, a normal party member who paid uh, at the time i think it was five pounds they reduced the cost to join the party as well and labor party in britain became the largest labor party in the whole europe at the time i believe over six hundred thousand members in 2017 or Man, 18, that's a game right so uh, they, uh, yeah that, that was a game change but they did that because they thought they're going to basically, they're going to destroy the radical left. What happened was a lot of young people paid the fiver, joined, voted for Jeremy Corbyn. There was two leadership challenges uh, against Jeremy Corbyn and constant briefing against him. Uh, finally, after 2019 election and he failed to uh, increase their majority, he went out, Keira Starmer, came in and he said i'm gonna be i'm gonna unify the party over jeremy corbyn's policies uh, check out his 10 pledges when he was reading uh, running for the leadership and then uh, but i'm gonna be a more presentable face i'm gonna be a more sort of a premier like because jeremy corbyn didn't wear a tie uh, and he used to you know bike so he wasn't presentable uh, uh, anyways the, suddenly, right before the Labour's, his first actual uh, Labour conference, because the last one was basically cancelled because of COVID, he suddenly announced he's going to change the leadership uh, uh, election rules back to the old system. Not yeah. exactly back to the old system, but very similar to that. Then a day before the conference... There was the report that he, in the face of backlash from the left and the right, because the right was upset that you're overshadowing the conference, right? Um, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the face of backlash to that, he, uh, sorry, he dropped, uh, he dropped the changes. But he didn't drop the changes. They watered them down. Mm -hmm. And in my view, from the details I, I read, they haven't watered them down. Uh, enough sadly and uh, sadly uh, it, it passed I think 52 percent to 46 percent it passed the uh, conference so uh, the leadership rule uh, election rules are changed now it's going to be much more difficult I think for somebody from the left to get but can uh, normal uh, people uh, still vote now can normal members still vote do you know oh, that they, they, yeah, yeah, they still but the the portion has decreased. Uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure about that, but I do know the threshold uh, to become a candidate has increased in mm -hmm. terms of like you need more support from parliamentary members. I sorry, I, I need to rewatch no, that's and reread some articles to get uh, because too much details was in yeah. there. But. Uh, uh, so it was a sort of a win for Keir Starmer, but I don't think he, again, as I mentioned in our previous video, which I recommend people check out, I don't think he knows what he's doing because mm -hmm. I think he's digging his own grave. Because yeah. People like Peter Mandelson and all that know that he neither has the charisma nor the will 
nor the ability to become to another come. Tony Blair. And uh, they're going to get rid of him as soon as they can. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Um, it definitely seems like he's not liked by anyone and he's, he's just, you know, yeah. And, and I want to give a shout out, by the way, to myself, because mm-hmm. in, the, in the elections that followed Jeremy Corbyn's uh, uh, leadership, I supported Emily Thornberry, who's seen as somebody as more on the right thing. But Emily Thornberry, unlike Keir Starmer, has, a, has guts, has, mm. has a spine. You know, unlike, unlike Rebecca Long Bailey, who was seen as Jeremy Corbyn's successor, but who has shown no guts to stand up to the, uh, to the right of the party or to the Keir Starmer, while uh, Emily Thornberry, a former shadow foreign minister, had the best I, I just love her so much as a politician she has had the best uh, performances uh, against Boris Johnson I would say even better than Jeremy Corbyn uh, and and even better than John McDonald and she's somebody who had guts and I think she she was somebody who could uh, actually unify the Labour Party and actually move the Labour Party because she was interested in power I think Kira Starmer is more interested in just being a nice guy I mean, she's still around. And, is she still relevant, or? Oh yeah, yeah. She's. She, I don't think she's ever going to become a leader. So, mm. Sadly, I think people like her. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. If maybe she's still around. She did a great interview about uh, trans issues recently, which brought her back up in the limelight. But I just, I wish somebody like a leader should be like her. She's. She would have been the perfect first female leader for. Uh, uh, Labour Party. All I know, Labour has had an interim female leader, but uh, as a elected leader. But because she wasn't backed by unions, uh, even though I think she would have been much more uh, uh, compromising to unions than Keir Starmer. And by the way, if somebody can explain to me why some unions are backing Keir Starmer, I tried to Google that, but I couldn't find any good articles on that. If anybody from UK can. Because I don't understand why would any union, because in in passing of these leadership rule changes, unions helped him. So that that was odd. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, so right before we move to Germany, I just have a very quick, very short question. If you could just refresh my memory, Jeremy Corbyn ran in two elections, I think. Was he any close to winning at all? Like, uh, how badly did he lose in the elections? Was he close? I can't remember. No, 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 no. In 2017, he did great. He increased labor Mm -hmm. uh, vote share. He increased labor vote seats. uh, And that was the election that Theresa May thought, oh, I'm going to destroy this radical left-wing guy. He he got more votes. Uh, This was recently pointed out by... Ah, oh, shit. I, sorry, I forget who pointed out in an interview. He, in, he got more votes than Tony Blair did uh, in, 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 in his 1997, okay. I believe, elections. So he, got, he has gotten more votes, although there is population changes and yeah, all yeah. that. So in 2017, he did great. And he was working against the UK media uh, press. UK oh, press. Oh, yeah, for sure. So vicious. No, I recall so all that. So vicious yeah. and so But right-wing. okay, yeah, yeah. No, I recall he, that. And but then... To, but and 2019, sadly, again, if his party wasn't so divided on the whole fucking EU and another referendum vote, I think, because he was not ever... A, he was back in the day, he was anti EU actually, because you know, le- he was like a left wing Tony yeah. Ben style type thing. But, anyways, by 2019, they got decimated Labour, they lost the yeah. red wall and all that. Yeah. But, but the a- analysis had shown that in areas that Labour members were supportive of a people's vote or supportive of a uh, uh, op- sorry, opposing Brexit, Labour did worse than areas where labor was more neutral. Okay, I see. All right, okay, great. Uh, thank you for that. But yeah, I forgot, before moving to Germany, there is Australia left. You had some news about Australia relating to oh, sorry, climate yeah. change, yeah. Yeah, so uh, before uh, uh, moving on from the Commonwealth, uh, Australian Prime Minister has signaled he may not attend the UN's landmark, landmark 
climate conference in November as his government faces continued criticism of its poor uh, climate record. So Scott Morrison is somebody who who's uh, uh, who has signaled he's not going to he, he the excuse his officials and his representative uh, have given is that. Uh, it's because of, you know, COVID and uh, 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 traveling is hard and there are security issues that needs to be dealt at home. But um, uh, I think uh, it's more to do with the fact that he's been accused of being a climate denier. His response to the wildfires in Australia, I believe a year or two years ago, the bushfires mm -hmm. was quite uh, disastrous. He, I mean, he would go on a vacation while half of Australia was burning. He would laugh as people complained about their livelihood being destroyed. So he has a terrible record yeah. on, uh, 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 on uh, uh, climate change in many ways. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a place where he would be obviously very, uh, very much on the spotlight, on the hot seat, so to speak. So it makes sense for him to avoid that. And it shows yeah. uh, just uh, another, uh, it's another signal of his type of, the character he is, just the gutless, uh, he's a very, he's a very gutless technocrat, I would say. Yeah, I know. So. Definitely, definitely. Wouldn't say otherwise there. But okay, um, that's that. Um, should we move on to Germany? Uh, yes, let's move to the German brief. So before, I, I know that you found a, a lot of information or particular things that you want to talk about, but first just want to give a general overview. And so for anybody who hasn't followed closely, so pretty much the Social Democrats, which aren't Angela Merkel's party, Angela Merkel's party, the Christian Democratic CDU, CDU whatever, they're, technic they're conservatives. So a party who is technically to their left has gained most of the votes. So I'll just put right here a graph with uh, the votes, the highest amount of votes, but very. And then the other aspect that's interesting is I think the Greens managed to get a historic number of seats. I mean, they surpassed what they had previously done by very little. But what is different now is that they could very much be part of the government because none of the first two parties got enough votes to build a two-party coalition, I believe. So they're going to have to build a three-party coalition or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, the Greens could play a big role. So before passing it back to you, overall, you could say it was a little bit of a win for the socialists and the left, although Sam will show how um, perhaps it's not really the case when you start looking at a, at a breakdown because there were five parties who, who got votes, right? If I'm not mistaken who got a good number uh, of seats. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, well, so I'll be showing five, down the screen uh, right, right now anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just pulling up something for, okay. It's in front of me, is it? Is but yeah, and as I mentioned right. in the beginning sorry. of the okay. show, it's going to take, it's unclear which one of the two parties can even form the government. Technically speaking, it should be the social Democrats who could, who should lead but it's not even 100%, and it's going to take a few months, very possibly, no, until they form a government. But yeah, go ahead. No, the, the main thing I disagreed with your introduction, sorry about that. No, no that problem. You, you, you kind of categorized it as a sort of a, a super, like Greens becoming part of coalition as a bit of a, mm -hmm. a new development. It's not new. Like Germany has always pretty much been a coal governed by coalition. I mentioned, I think previously, German foreign minister for many years was a Green Party member uh, because actually, for example, that's a very big, that's, a, that's a, again, these are all traditions. There is yeah. no laws uh, for this. For example, usually wh whichever party uh, has the chancellorship, uh, the second largest or the third largest partner gets the uh, foreign ministry because mm -hmm. pretty much okay, so foreign Greens ministry have is a bit been... of a Oh yeah, yeah. I thought and, Greens had never by, been so, part of the main coalition, like 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 the no, main part of the government, or they uh, no for not for the I believe not for the last sixteen or more years okay. at least. 
what they have. But and actually, I, I mean, a big the thing is the reason I know this so. I mean, I always remember this is because the German uh, foreign minister played a huge role in original Iranian nuclear negotiations when Hassan Rouhani back then was was the head of Iranian uh, team of negotiators. Okay. And they used to meet a lot. And he was a really interesting character. He, he's actually, he was, I don't know if he's just alive, he was married to an Iranian uh, lady as well, Iranian-German uh, lady. Gotcha. But anyways, uh, so, yeah, so I wouldn't say it's that super. Although, mm-hmm. yeah, the Greens uh, did increase their vote share and seats and all that, but uh, not as much as they had hoped. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, 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 that's uh, something to keep in my mind. Uh, Dailinke, I don't know anybody know, knows them or not. Dailinke is a, like... They are the more left-wing German party. They are the uh, sort of the five-star movement, or yeah, they came about during that same time, sort of uh, a bit more left-wing ver- version. Uh, yeah, uh, of this socialists. Because the social sorry. democrats are like central center left. Center left. Uh, yeah, this, yeah. So they're they're so really not even. They they. Uh, they actually did very badly and they got only 4.9 i believe percent of the vote and uh, the Di Lincoln the Di Lincoln the, not Lincoln. the social yeah, democrats they, they, they got the most amount of votes yeah yes they lost i believe uh, Di Lincoln sorry i'm just looking at uh, i don't know if this is Di i think they lost about 30 seats so that's quite uh, that's quite bad. Then you have the hardcore sort of some describe them as neo-Nazi alternative Germany party thingy. I, I don't know how to call them AFD, alternative Führer. I don't know if mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what it is. But they they also uh, had a reduction. But they've only I think they only lost like three percent of. Uh, popular vote uh, so not as bad as the left uh, the hard left let's say the surprise victors here was FDB which is this sort of uh, pro-business very liberal uh, sort of uh, uh, very business friendly party yeah. uh, they, they, they were the surprise winners basically because uh, you know people expected the yeah. Greens to become uh, king makers, but uh, FTB and Greens are now. Uh, so king can makers. you explain? Okay, so one thing first, the FTB still got three percent less than the Greens, but I understand they like overachieved and the Greens underachieved. And what's this king maker um, concept that you just mentioned? Look, you need. Uh, I mean, I'm not exactly familiar with the German system because depending on the bill, it could sometimes you need absolute majority sometimes you need uh, j- just the simple majority to i don't know which one german uh, bundestag uh, works based on but to form an effective coalition you basically need more than 50 percent of the parliament right mm-hmm. and the social democrats now have 24 i believe percent or 25 something yeah, like that 25 and right? a half yeah yeah the greens have 14 that's, so that's 40 together is that's put together is around 40 if the, the ftb then the surprise vic, like surprise yeah uh, the black sheep or whatever you want to call them they got 11 percent. that puts them just above 50 percent right uh, f- for the last 16 years what you had in germany was a grand coalition Grand coalition is when the two biggest parties, like SDU and uh, S- uh, Social Democrats, they g- rule together. Uh, that's kind of uh, what I was but, referring to in the beginning. But, Thank you for explaining that. All right. All right. But the real, I think the real takeaway from these results, all of the things I said are pretty much bullshit, and you can probably get mm-hmm. them uh, at other places in a much more detailed and more uh, uh, structured way. But I do think the biggest takeaway should be is the fracture that we see in German politics, which I think we see everywhere. 
but uh, you now the two biggest parties in Germany together cannot form a coalition that would uh, command more than 50% of the uh, Bundestag. Uh, so uh, that's, is, that's quite big. And even like the coalition that is Olaf Schulz, the leader of the Social Democrats, who will have the first chance usually because he's, he's got the largest party. The coalition he's talking about is a three-party coalition between people with com very opposing views on many things. Uh, so uh, it will be, a, I would imagine, even if that coalition comes about, it will be a, a weak coalition and a strange one. Uh, although I should say, just news-wise, Armin Laschet, the leader of STU, is not giving up. Unlike a lot of people in his party are calling for him to resign and stuff, he's saying that no, uh, uh, the result is mixed and whoever can form a coalition is the winner and I'm going to try to form a coalition. It seems unlikely, but he's going to he, he's going to try. So, you know, yeah, I know. I know that's funny. Also. So even though he finished second, he wants to become chancellor. You, no, no, but that's fair enough to be. Uh, I'm actually, I don't have anything against that, but I think the, I mean, the, considering the background, the fact that he's basically, he was, uh, you know, he was riding off of yeah. Merkel 16 yeah. years of reign and all that. I think, uh, yeah, he, he, he's, he's badly uh, fucked up. But, but I actually think, to be honest, I am. I like the German system of like. I do think prime ministers should be elected within the parliament, mm -hmm. not as a sort of necessarily the leader of the most popular party or all that. I like. I, see, I like yeah. parliamentary politics, but that's a personal. Anyway, but yeah, very tangent, fragmented. Tangent, so that was so. your yeah no. So that was your main kind of point and takeaway. But yeah, uh, quite well, fragmented. So I, if you look, is like centrist with twenty five, then conservatives with. 19 points then greens with almost 15 then these like pro-business ones 11 and a half and then you still have three more parties which vary between left and 8%. right again yeah 10 and other parties eight percent yeah uh, so, so that yeah. was i also had another sort of takeaway which again these are personal views maybe i'm wrong uh, very interestingly, I was watching and reading a lot of DW and uh, uh, thank you, Google Translate, by the way, mm -hmm. you allow me to read a lot of German uh, articles. Uh, it's really weird reading it in, you know, Google Translate, yeah. but it's still, it gets the point across. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, like things were that, oh, you know, uh, social Democrats are sort of Olaf Schulz, especially he's concil conciliatory towards China. And, uh, and uh, stuff uh, and uh, Russia but the Greens because of human rights they are very mm. much against Russia and uh, China and all that that could be a big issue in the cabinet making and all that uh, so this was the very much the line in on DW and on a lot of places I saw I personally think that's a bit of a uh, I think it's a bit of a red herring or maybe mischaracterization. Uh, the Green German Party is backed by a lot of pa powerful financial interests in Germany, which are uh, backed by green, green energy. Uh, I, I mean, how you describe green energy, I know is a very controversial issue, how batteries are produced or wind farms and all that. But green energy, uh, Germany is the hub of green energy in Europe. And I'm sure there is a lot of economic rivalry between uh, German companies and Chinese companies who are also uh, both German, Chinese state and China, Chinese companies are heavily invested in this segment. You also have Russia providing uh, cheap gas and Nord Stream 2 and all that. That's another sort of, you know, whenever... For example, whenever gas and oil prices go down, the demand for green energy also goes down. So I, I do think there are also those factors uh, more than human. I think human rights, I, I mean, again, I care about human rights. It, China and Russia are both uh, major, uh, uh, major violators of human rights, I'm sure. Yeah. So is Germany, by the way. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but, but I think that's more about that 
more about economic and fine. I haven't been able to find any evidence uh, except the fact that there are a lot of uh, German uh, green companies that contribute to the Green Party. But mm -hmm. I'm looking, and uh, yeah, that's just a hypothesis. Interesting, so very not interesting. A, not a not a conclusion. Yeah. All right, now, so uh, we can now start with our Iran brief, I think, which, uh, you know, we usually provide some news both internally and uh, uh, about the geopolitics of Iran. Uh, uh, this time, it's mostly about foreign policy, but <clears throat> let's uh, start with the uh, two internal news. First of all, uh, just to give a context, inflation in, in Iran is going crazy. Uh, point to point uh, inflation, yearly inflation, monthly inflation, all of it. It's going crazy. Living costs are uh, extremely uh, high, even uh, with price controls and all that. So <clears throat> this has led to a couple of development. First, you had uh, uh, the school year, by the way, just started, although mostly uh, online due to COVID uh, until full vaccination uh, in three to two months. That's what the government has promised. So the uh, education year started. That uh, started uh, with uh, teachers striking. So a lot of teachers has gone on, have, have gone on strike in Iran, uh, all around Iran. And uh, I, I think fairly so. They're not paid uh, at all, like cons considering living costs. Uh, they are not paid well at all, sadly. Most of them have to do a lot of tutoring, other second type of jobs and all that. And uh, thankfully, this time around, unlike a lot of previous times, uh, government has promised to meet some of their demands. And uh, because it's been such a widespread strike, hopefully, uh, I think... Uh, uh, you know, they have to meet their demands, you know, to, it's, there is no way, you know, uh, that's the thing, yeah, strikes, by the way, I don't believe in electoral politics much, but I do think the strikes are <clears throat> very, very powerful uh, okay, very uh, nice. when, when organized. Um, I'll but, keep this but, example but, uh, in my back pocket when it comes up in another podcast and you say that strikes are never effective or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, I probably make some okay. shit. Notes right here. Okay. I, I, just let okay, me continue. make a general, general apology for any generalized <laughs> statement I make. But uh, thankfully, the new president, although as I mentioned before, I don't think presidents in Iran are that important or anything, but what they say and they do is an indication of the regime or the state or the general trend of the system. He said that the inflation is a red line for us and we're going to start tackling it within the next month or so. So, yeah. and to be fair, in terms of vaccination, a lot of people say that the deals were made in the previous governments, but in terms of vaccination, the current government has acted very well. And you, again, I, I think the explanation is not even that the deals were made in the previous government, is that the current government was the shadow government before, and they would have put, <clears throat> so to speak, they would put, uh, what do you say? They would put a stick in the wheels of the, uh, uh, in the previous government. Now that they're in charge, now that they have the parliament, they have the uh, executive, they have the judiciary. Uh, now, uh, now uh, as one article put it, it's time to, uh, caress the people. It's time to be nice to people, right? So uh, I hope, again, inflation, just like vaccination, will be <clears throat> done uh, well, uh, you know, inflation control, because living costs right now for people is just, uh, you know, stupid stuff, like, because tomatoes, onions, these are, like, you know, in Iran, these are uh, indicators of people's normal people's uh, like uh, bread that type of thing it's it's bad it needs to get control so yeah i, I wanted to mention these two uh, things that yeah the government is apparently tackling that mm -hmm. but more on the international news and uh, a, a bit more geopolitically speaking uh, any questions on internal no no, no. continue please 
sorry. So you had uh, uh, Naftali Bennett, the new Israeli p prime minister, the first prime minister born in a settlement and a very right wing, even more right wing than uh, Netanyahu, but in a more left wing government because of mm -hmm. the coalition system. <clears throat> By the way, he's like he's part of the very small party and the guy who has the largest party is the foreign minister mm -hmm. is the foreign minister or a state minister something anyway but he gave a speech at the un <clears throat> he, he yeah he said that uh, yeah he will uh, <clears throat> iran's nuclear program or nuclear weapon program as he alleged as he uh, on based on no evidence mm -hmm. he claims uh, he uh, has crossed red lines words are not enough we are at a watershed moment uh, this was immediately rebuked by iranian officials uh, saying it it was full of lies and you know uh, it was bullshit and considering the recent statements by benny gantz and by uh, other israeli officials and uh, then I, I think it was this speech was more for Israel's internal consumption rather than a real because I, that's I, the only I, thing that I makes mean, sense. Uh, <clears throat> the, the foreign policy doesn't change much with government, but I think the new government will be a slightly more in line with U.S. foreign policy, which is a slightly more concili conciliatory compared to Trump. Again, all of this is very slight. So don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about shifts. I'm talking yeah. about very tiny like changes in degrees of approach. So uh, yeah, but but no, but, I but yeah, I, 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 but the harsh words and all that. I think that was very much, uh, 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 you know, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, just rhetoric. Yeah. But on a more substantive basis, interestingly, uh, UN Atomic Aid, uh, we reported recently that UN Atomic Agency and Iran came to a deal uh, about the monitoring issue. Now, in a statement on Sunday, uh, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, said Iran was breaking an agreement by not allowing the agency to service equipment at Tessa Karaj complex, a mm -hmm. centrifuge manufacturing workshop. So uh, already the deal is getting shaky. Another interesting factor was that two days ago you had Russia urging US to, do, uh, to take action on Iran nuclear issue. But then you had also reports today that uh, I couldn't confirm the reports, but there were some rumors and reports that Russia was also urging Iran to act faster on the issue. I think uh, Russian officials understand that uh, U.S. Uh, primaries are coming. And yeah, the golden time is now. <clears throat> okay, yeah, very interesting. To make a deal happen, like you were saying yeah, last that's time. That's my once... view, by the way. Yeah. No, no substantive references. For me. Yeah, okay, okay, nice, nice. But uh, the, uh, the rumors and the unconfirmed report of Russian urging Iran was from BBC. It's just my guess is that Russia is thinking of U.S. primaries. Yeah. <laughs> and then not primaries, um, you mean... Oh, no, yeah, no, no, you're not talking about primaries. You mean just different governor elections and state election and Congress, or they... Yeah, prim yeah well, <clears throat> sorry, not primaries, yeah, Congress, congressional yeah. elections, sorry, because the congressional elections are every uh, two years, I believe, or so. No, I think they're I, still every four years, it's just some fall, you know, it depends when they fall, so I think some yes, of them yes, fall uh, that's between, between um, presidential elections. Yes, that's true, it depends on the uh, area and all that. <clears throat> district, district. Sorry. And also to add, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, regional geopolitical tensions, you also had, again, reports that Iranian backed paramilitary groups were bombed in Syria by Israeli forces. Uh, none of it, again, uh, <clears throat> confirmed, and the news came from Western sources. Iran hasn't confirmed this, but again, likely true. Usually, Iran doesn't confirm these. Uh, because they don't, you know, Iran doesn't, it, that's again my view, 
because Iran doesn't want to escalate because you mm-hmm. know if you confirm them then you yeah. have to respond, respond and then yeah all of that so yeah you you also had those tensions and I think those tensions are in a way uh, I I don't think there is much uh, wo- there is much danger of war between Iran Saudi Israel US any of these things. But th- these type of things, we're going to see a lot more now. We're going to see Syria, these type of places becoming increasingly, uh, you know, places for competition. Yeah. Okay. So um, shall we move on to Afghanistan? Yeah, sure. Before, yeah, That before be- moving on to Korea and the U.S., um, North Korea. Yeah. I never thought we'd do a story about them, but I'll <clears> save that for after. But yeah, so what's the latest with Afghanistan? What caught your attention? So uh, interestingly, uh, let me just um, oh, a couple of things in uh, uh, about Afghanistan, which um, sorry, oh, where, where is my? Excuse me, it's extremely becoming hard to use Google <laughs> Chrome's. Oh, here we go. Okay, so a couple of uh, general things. First of all, you had a very, uh, Ashraf Ghani was the former president of Afghanistan before Taliban takeover. There was a, <clears throat> apparently there was a Facebook post by him that criticized uh, people who are resisting Taliban and urged the international community to come to terms with Taliban. Then he tweeted that his Facebook has been hacked and that's all a lie. Uh, So there is crazy things going on there. At the same time, you also have these reports by uh, people like Ken uh, Klippestein and Intercept and others that uh, the resistance leaders like Shah uh, Massoud's son and uh, uh, the former former deputy president for Amir Al-Lahian, I believe, <clears throat> Sorry, again, with the names and all that. Uh, there are all these reports that these lead, these resistance leaders that claim to be in Afghanistan are not actually in Afghanistan. So uh, the whole sort of resistance to Taliban is, is mm-hmm. still a very chaotic thing. But the, the, the reports are, uh, I should point out the reports by Intercept and all that, they include a lot of sources but not much evidence. So again, like 30, 20 officials, but not much evidence. So, you know, I think they're probably, they're pretty substantiated, I think, but n- nothing is 100%. You also had uh, a sort of some, uh, <clears throat> sorry, some uh, Afghanistani resistance uh, uh, groups announcing uh, that they're going to, uh, they were basically former members of Kenny government. They announced that they're going to form a government in exile. I don't know mm-hmm. how serious that's going to be taken, but you know, uh, you know, they they are going ahead with that. That's at the same time when the at the UN summit, the Afghanistan's uh, a spokesperson was prevented from speaking to the summit. Yeah, and, I was just going to ask you about that. So what happened? Yeah. Because uh, well, right now from was... the previous government, sorry, let me just, I'll just cut you off there. Go I'm sorry. Ahead. If yes. I'm not mistaken, from the previous government, they still have their UN representative at the UN, like Afghanistan yes. does. Ex- but yes. for Mr. because the General Assembly was coming up, and typically it's not the... It's not your UN representative who gives a speech. Usually it's either the president or the prime minister. But anyway, the Taliban, since they don't really have that, I think they scrambled very quickly and just nominated some Taliban member in Qatar to give the speech at the UN General Assembly. But yeah, that's the last I heard about it. So yeah, I mean, that's what I heard. So what happened at the end? Oh, I'm not talking about that. And sorry, I have no idea about the Taliban actually candidating something. What I do know about is Mr. Qolam Mohammad Ishaqzi. He was uh, the yeah, UN, uh, Afghanistan's UN representative, which does have like, you know, unless you're like Iran or Cuba, you know, or America, these nations in my view, which have a bit of a 
complex to be honest the emotional complex yeah i, I want to give a speech you know you say no this, usually you it's the word this. leaders yeah. no look biden went uh, you just told us yeah, exactly. about the israeli US, prime Iran. minister it's Again, typically yeah, all, no it's typically like the president what about devices. norway is huh? i don't know i'm, I'm sure they said the really prime minister <laughs> I'm sure. prime minister really? I'm, sure, I'm guessing. Just, uh, who gives this? Anyway, but they, uh, they, he was supposed to talk. Uh, Mr. Eshaqzai was the representative of Ashraf Ghani's government. Mm-hmm. That's the report I have. Uh, but but <clears throat> but he wanted to, obviously wanted to talk against Taliban a lot, and it seems that UN doesn't want to completely antagonize Taliban. And again, as a Shia. Uh, culturally Shia Iranian. I have no love for Taliban, mm. but I can understand the politics of it. Yeah. So they have given no official explanation as of yet, but <clears throat> he was present. He was prevented from talking. So, so the whole uh, opposition to Taliban is in pretty much disarray yeah. completely. So I guess the UN they kind of met taliban halfway <laughs> so they, they didn't because i heard that they had nominated that the taliban wanted someone from qatar to give the speech but i guess they were like okay we won't let you but we won't let this guy either so i guess they kind of met them halfway in a way yeah i i, I had no idea about the fact that taliban had already put up a no they quickly Although went through their sense. facebook contact and like no 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 okay this guy this guy <laughs> So who linked in uh, <laughs> LinkedIn resume? <laughs> okay, five years. Okay, <laughs> Two, oh, five years of tribal representation <laughs> at the highest level. <laughs> I did, I negotiated over two hundred chips. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, don't patronize Anyways. people. Okay, keep on. Hey, <laughs> pay, I'm I'm from Iran, so. <laughs> I, I think I'm allowed. That's true. I, yeah, yeah, isn't it? <clears throat> I don't know. Anyway, you oppress but, Af- Afghanis, so I'm not too sure. Now I'm joking. <laughs> Afghan. Anyway, anyways, anyway. <clears throat> All right, I'm allowed. Uh, but <laughs> interestingly, though, uh, sadly, uh, not so much interestingly, sadly, religious and ethnic tensions seem to be rising up uh, as uh, it seems that uh, in the Talibani civil war increasingly Haqqani network and Pakistani backed group which is a viewed largely not uh, there is no all these groups are so fluid at the moment everything is so fluid on the ground that everything I talk about there is no there is no concrete things right now so take it with a huge grain of salt but the salafi more religious more authoritarian groups seem to be winning uh, political positions and political uh, uh, authority uh, uh, representative and elders of hezara community which is a, a persian speaking shia oriented not necessarily shia <coughs> group in afghanistan have uh, described many acts of forced, uh, you know, evictions, viol- violence, and all that. It is still not widespread, but it's happening. Uh, Tajikistan's president, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. R- I think it's called Rahmanov, uh, Imam Rahmanov, uh, he, he warned that, you know, all uh, groups uh, in uh, all ethnic groups, Tajiks are large minority in uh, Afghanistan, Tajiks are Persian speakers of Central Asia. Uh, they, uh, they, they all ethnic groups should be respected. Taliban quickly responded by saying this is meddling in our affairs and, uh, you know, all that. So none of this is our good signs at the moment. Uh, uh, and uh, they we're gonna do a whole deep dive on the cabinet and all that and the cabinet so far it seems to be going towards a more uh, hardcore basis which is a bit worrying but you know it's a still everything is very fluid so it's a way too soon to comment uh, as of yet yeah <clears throat> it's barely been like five weeks um five weeks i guess since the withdrawal and i guess on tv though i've just seen one or two um 
one or two unfortunate things to add. I mean, one is the one that we mentioned already last week that although the Taliban said that women could go back to school and everything, and they, they still haven't, women have still not returned <clears throat> to secondary education, if I'm they, not mistaken. They s- there were two promises specifically made. They said that the women will be back in a schools and in education places and all that within two to three months. But they also announced we're going to announce a plan for that mm-hmm. within a week or 10 days. And that date has passed yeah. as of yet. Maybe this video gets published later. And they haven't announced any plans or anything like that. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then and another... They, like, and 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 a stupid shit is I mean this is a stupid shit that BBC covers and I know it's a bit propagandaish, but it is giving it's like giving excuse to your enemy in a way like if Taliban was actually about resistance they shouldn't be uh, right now they are issuing warnings to barbers to tr- uh, not to treat and that's what ears. I was gonna say that was. Gonna... I was going to say that's uh, making mean, the rounds this is right bo- now. Uh, look, this is not the biggest issue of uh, <laughs> Afghanistan. I know yeah. even if they say, okay, b- b- not shaving is banned. It's not as important as food, gas, women's education, women's contraception, health, all of that. But with this kind of a stupid policy. Yeah, 100%. The, uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, no, so exactly. Not so- to mention... Not to mention basic human freedoms. But yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's it's apparently in one of the provinces or something, right? I saw that it was specifically one province, I think. So, yeah, yeah they're going one, around. One governor, I believe. Yeah, or, telling barbers yeah. to not, you know, to not shave anybody's beards. But, okay, um, so that's with Afghanistan. Did you say you have a By North way, Korea story? Yeah, I have a yeah, North Korea and U.S. thing. Just before that, I would add there is also, I believe in, was it in Tajikistan or somebody will correct me? One of those countries, they banned beards. Because they <laughs> said it promoted, uh, it promoted uh, Islamism. So you had to share. It's like, uh, I, just focus be- on real issues. Anyway. No, beards are very. Focusing on beard and hair. But I everywhere really in the should. world, there are debates <laughs> surrounding beards. It's a very hotly debated mm, topic. Okay. It doesn't usually go to getting banned, but yeah. No, no. But it's just so debated. funny how in different cultures it represents totally different things. It's just so funny. At different the times, role that be- different at different times too. <laughs> One no, day no, beard is good, the next day, yeah. No, debate it with passion, like you debate mm-hmm. Andy Warhol or mm-hmm. fucking Da Vinci or one book, but don't yeah. debate like mm-hmm. politics. I don't know. I, I feel like politics is not. No. Like I agree Anyways. with you there, buddy. But let's. But yeah, continue. <clears throat> yeah, let's get to this sort of maybe maybe this is something that will become more common as time will go on. But our Pacific sort of <clears throat> Pacific U.S. Uh, brief. Uh, you had a couple of, uh, ap- according to a uh, South Korean army, you, uh, you on s- Saturday, on sorry, Tuesday morning, you had a, a short, short distance missile uh, 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 fired by uh, North Korean uh, of authorities and Amer- Americans into the ocean. Into the ocean, yes, into the waters. Uh, no, of course not. <laughs> but but the, I swear, North Korea. Yeah, go ahead. No, it, by the way, as somebody who is an environmentalist, I always find this so like, just yeah, we are testing a nuclear bomb. Where in the ocean? Mm-hmm. That's not like, no, nothing's there, right? And, anyway, anyways, that's a besides the point. But anyway, yeah, they the America quickly responded by calling it a. a uh, malicious, uh, malicious uh, political move, uh, and uh, and something that reduces security for in the region and for U.S. allies. Uh, but also, U.S. said that this is no immediate threat to us uh, no, because not. you know we have a good dif- uh, yeah well yeah. Uh, but but they, you know they reassured their uh, allies and their forces at the same time just quickly uh, uh, Kim Sung uh, they, uh, the North Korean representative not the leader in, in the UN 
said that uh, North Korea has every right to defend itself and U.S. is the one that is causing tensions through its war games. You know, the usual back and forth between North Korea and uh, U.S., which I suspect we see more and more with the current democratic government. Yeah, okay. Um, so I see, I see there. So uh, North Korea sent the UN representative to give a UN speech. I'll give you that one there. Sorry, putting man. that aside, putting that aside, putting that aside. That, I didn't North... mean that as a jab at you. <laughs> Did you feel that that's as... <laughs> this is nothing. I easily dodged it. But um, coming back to the story, North Korea news, you know, you always hear like network TV and like mainstream TV, they're after ratings and views. I don't understand how the North Korea stories fall in the narrative. They're always the most boring stories ever. Yes, I mean, dropping bombs, I get your environmental concern there. That's very true. But in the grand scheme of stories, the North Korean ones are always like this. It's always like North Korea launched a rocket. It's the same one. And you can also predict when they come because sometimes it's just their annual trainings and they report on those annual military exercises every time as if it's like, oh my God, no way. Nobody had any idea they were going to do this exercise now. Which nation does that? But yeah, the North Korea stories have to be the most repetitive ones in mainstream media. I I, I do believe one sort maybe twice Trump canceled them. So, you know, that, that, that's a big deal because, because war games actually are usually basically like, okay, if we're going to attack you, that's how we do it. Yeah. So they are very threatening in a way. Well, But yeah, I but... do see your point with that. And I, I would say, in a way, that's why I try to, I, I know my views are worthless pretty much, but I try to add my take or our take sometimes at the end of the news, because you can pretty much say that about all political news, all elections, like Iran and US have been negotiating since I just mentioned, Rouhani used to be the lead 100% negotiator. You're, you know what I mean? Like You're right. This picture, but the, like they the, dropped some bombs and then they did a game. You're 100% and right. You're 100% right. But the North Korea one is just particularly the same story, yes. like over and over and over again. And it, it, they can never make it longer than a five minute segment <laughs> because there's nothing else to say. It's always very like it's like a short segment because they it ran out of things. Bombs. Say, yeah. We are we are upset. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you are right. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe because we don't know much about inside of North Korea. It's harder to. I don't know, to have no, any other true. news <laughs> except they drop the bomb. <laughs> and it's yeah. usually South Korea that reports it as well, or <laughs> Japan. It's not even them. It's yeah. like, shit. <laughs> Anyways, but uh, shall I move on to a yes, quick US? Please. This, this was a news that, I don't know what's your take. That's, uh, so this was a news that was substantially reported by other news outlets. So uh, uh, a week ago and stuff, I didn't feel like we should talk about it. But I found, again, like we can have maybe a special sort of take on it. But just to give the new, uh, just to give a bit of a context, uh, Mark Milley, am I saying that right? Mark Milley or Mark Miley, uh, chairman of Joint Chief of his Staff, has come under criticism and some people actually praise him because on the last days of Trump's administration, he told apparently the staff that for a use of a nuclear weapon, there is a process and him and another like officials are part of that process. It's not just president saying push the button. Uh, and also he apparently contacted Chinese governments, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to reassure them that there is no danger of a sudden or uh, attack which by the way if i was chinese government and i was giving getting a call from a top general you are <laughs> yeah. saying don't worry don't worry there is no nuclear attack coming my Seriously. first reaction would be like guys there's a nuclear attack coming <laughs> let's pack <laughs> yeah so, i think that's borderline uh, a threat i think 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can I, argue I, that's like a threat. <laughs> it's kind of like yeah, I know, Casparian move type of thing. Anyway, anyways, like the whole that's that's why I kind of want to cover it because it's such a funny story. Because yeah. I think some people are praising this guy as a hero who saved America from Trump and from a and the world from a nuclear winter and all that. Then you have all these other people who are saying that. Uh, you know, uh, he 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 was trying to do a coup d'état and mm-hmm. trying to take over the power from the elected president who had less, who had three million votes less than the <laughs> other candidate. So yeah, just I, I'm not. By the way, I'm I'm mocking the outrage. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I, he was the officially elected president, uh, but it's just the outrage of these people for their. Uh, values anyway and by the way these reports are coming from bob uh, woodward and robert costa and bob woodward you know these are famous people so miley twice called his chinese opposite number to reassure him that the u.s would not conduct the surprise attack and the u.s general would alert beijing if the president tried to order one which the second one if had happened would it would i would assume count as a act of treason under the logan's act but i could be i, I a lawyer could clarify but okay, see. anyways uh by the way my battery is low so that's a danger uh i just wanted to uh, matt taibi and katie halper i think had a good take i think what actually happened was mark milley basically told the staff and i think the conversation he had with the chinese is very routine conversation they always have with Chinese and Russians. And from what I know, Iran, for example, when Iran was responding to Qasem Soleimani's uh, assassination with bombing of U.S. Uh, military stuff, they called the Russians to let the Americans know so they can evacuate first. Same with when I, I think Americans bombed certain Syrian uh ships or military bases they let the russians know so they let the syrians know so again i think these are routine and that's when when i say civil service runs the world that's that's what i mean basically uh but but i think mark milley now kind of wanted to pump up his chest and kind of become a darling uh, of uh, uh news shows and that type yeah. of thing like john john brenham and all these ex uh, useless bureaucrats whose uh, only uh, pretty much only achievement in life has been uh, rising through the ranks through uselessness and ineffectiveness. Uh, so I, 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 that's, I, I, that's why I thought maybe it's worth for us mentioning it. Yeah. Other people have done much better reporting, much more detailed and all that. But I, I just wanted to point out, I think it's mostly, again, hot air by a general trying to make himself more important while sadly feeding a cynical machine that is going to further alienate people uh, on the right especially from a political system yeah no that's very interesting and yeah i actually hadn't heard about this story so this is the first time i'm hearing about it but yeah your take seems to make sense yeah uh, the main no, uh, like you have to the main main two camps though my my take is you know whatever mm. the main two camps are some people are saying he's a savior who acted in a time of crisis to stabilize the country and the world in a way uh, and then some other people are saying he acted illegally and uh, like he undermined the elected uh, commander in chief and I, I see uh, reasonable arguments in both, but I think reality is probably much less, uh, much less uh, important. But, yeah. but the, those are important arguments to have at a different point. Okay, brilliant. All right, any, anything to add? Do you, no. Do you, do you, uh, question, do you uh, like... Do you think which is more important, democratic values, let's say, or a mm-hmm. uh, or a potential global war? Let's let's not go crazy nuclear war. Or okay. a global war. But what do you mean? What do you mean? What's like more if, important, if democratic value or? 
So if there, if a general should a general undermine an elected commander in chief uh, to avoid the international war, or or um, the the democratic values are more important. No, off the top of my head, I would say uh, yes, he should violate them. Okay, I don't know. I, I yeah. just wondered what you thought. I re- I I think. Why, what what point are you? Head, I, yeah. Because I think that's the substantive issue here, right? That which one is more important, democratic? If democratic uh, values are like total war, is that something we should go with, or should we? Or I see. Okay, values? I see what your point. You're I don't know. To this that. is something yeah. I, I struggle with, so I don't know. Yeah, I see. I wondered if, yeah, I I think top of my head I go with you, but who knows. Okay, all right. So now it's time to move on to our progressive world online section. We have a few stories. Sam is going to go um, through most of them and then he'll throw it back to me for Elizabeth Holmes' story. So hopefully we're going to talk about Elizabeth Holmes a few more times just because it's super, super, super fun. I mean, yeah, it's like comfort food for me. But <laughs> but and yeah. then we'll move on to progressive tweets. What are you going to say? No, it's uh, it's very enjoyable when you criticize or shut on somebody who deserves yeah. it. So, you know, and I mean, this a, I mean, don't want to get joy. into it now, but the the story is so funny. I mean, just like all the different oh, character that, people yeah. and like everything that happens is just so funny. And some people were hurt in the process, but not that much, not that many I, I, people. So. I can't the, if the if the movie is done by somebody like Adam Mc I I think they're making a movie I think Jennifer Lawrence I believe it's a series series if somebody like Adam McKay or somebody good does that that's like it's the perfect line between satire and just reality and yeah uh just yeah it's yeah, it's, yeah, but as you say, okay. it's but before we to be real. before we get to that, let's let's go over the other stuff. So why don't yeah. you get us started? So uh, yeah, you had uh, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at something. All right. So uh, as we all know, there is a major collapse of uh, uh, construction and basically Congo, uh, Congo, Cong- Congo. I conglomerate 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 in china ever grand probably the, I, I believe the biggest construction company housing company the uh, second one i uh, saw the it, second biggest developer in china second biggest developer in china wow uh, they uh, and that has had major economic uh, pre- repercussions or will have at least depending on how China will respond to it. And Dylan Ratigan, whom uh, sadly we haven't spoken much uh, as a recommendation in our online world stuff. He's great. He's uh, like on economic analysis, he's great. I think he was a great uh, host on MSNBC, if I'm not mistaken. I don't really know him, to be honest. He's famous for his very fiery interviews and all that. But I do think after he like there is this point in your life that you have hope and you think you can change things and you get angry and all that. And he clearly kind of lost it at some point and you can see it in his commentary as well. Kind of, uh, and uh, I love it since then because he's, he's, he provides one of the more, I think, cogent analysis. It's just very sober, very realistic, not one-sided or like he's he's probably like his solutions are probably leftists i'm not and he's comes from a certain point of view i'm not saying he's not biased but i think if you want to understand the situation check out his podcast and his uh, he, his presence on breaking point but quickly just to add my own thing i uh, i he doesn't specifically predict what's gonna happen but I think I kind of, from what I understood, I agree with him that because China is an authoritarian system, there's a good chance they will directly punish certain individuals 
but we'll uh, sort of uh, uh, slowly at least uh, re uh, repay or replenish the investments and the funds and all that uh, because it's also Therian estate and uh, especially because uh, Sheng Jingmao uh, is uh, per making a sort of very much a personal grab for power, so to speak. And also, I think he pointed out something very important, which is there is a lot of uh, sort of, uh, back in the days, we would call it court politics or something, that there are these families all invested in these companies that are connected to a state. And, you know, these there are th this line between private and public, especially in a country like China, but even so in a country like US or UK where uh, government sometimes owns huge shares in energy or in transportation companies, you know, uh, the lines are very blurry. So he points out that there are probably a lot of, you know, pressures internally like that, uh, you know, that, for example, you know, Jay, the Chinese government may want to punish people, but they may not be able to because of personal connections, things like that. But we don't know. That, that's what I sometimes love about his analysis, that he admits that you don't know, but what you don't know could be a very important factor, could be even the crucial factor. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Were you done? I thought you were done. No, I'm done with Dylan Ratch. That's yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, this story um, is kind of interesting, but I feel like it's trying to be like blown out of proportion because of anti-China stuff. So this construction, this development company has three hundred billion dollars in in debt. Three hundred billion. I don't know how much that is for a country like China if they wanna if they wanna interfere. Uh, which they will. And, you know, Dylan um, Radigan talks about, but, you know, they might not want to interfere too much because then what message would it send? It that, you know, precedent. Yeah, but I'm sure they can find other ways of making sure that a precedent in that way is not set. But yeah, they kind of try to link it and make it seem like it's like the 2008 financial crisis in the no, US. No, I mean, I, I, I all of that it. is kind of pushing it. Dylan Radigan wasn't saying this, but he was saying one thing, which you know, it was a bit weird. He was like, so this gives an opportunity for the U.S. to like seize in and take advantage of that. So he kind of also no, made no, it no. seem uh, like it's a bigger deal um, than it appears to be, at least to me. Uh, no, no. Well, I need to rewatch the video. Maybe. I yeah, maybe I maybe I, maybe misunderstood Wait. him, kind of. No, no, maybe. Very, me yeah. too. The, 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 the understanding I got that he said that he was uh, like he was comparing the estate planned economy with a, a sort of a more neoliberal economy of the US mm -hmm. in which there is more flexibility, le less planning and more flexibility to take uh, to take uh, uh, to take advantage of opportunities such as this while a state economies, uh, a state planned economies like China, uh, while in certain, like they, as he mentioned, they can make railways uh, in a very short time. They have uh, fragilities and vulnerabilities that are kind of act, could act as Achilles' heel. While more mm -hmm. flexible systems have sort of a spread the risk, which is, by the way, in. Uh, estate theory and all that they talk about vulnerability and uh, vulnerability and something else one is external one is internal sort of type thing okay all right okay. I, I i think by the way maybe you maybe you're right, yeah no i mean it was just was one talking... part i mean my main take on this whole story is that parts of the media and not even all of mainstream media because i also read in mainstream media analysts saying that this is being blown out of proportion it just seems that's kind of my whole main takeaway from this evergrand oh, yeah. evergrand company story i mean apparently one of their loans that they're like defaulting or however they need to pay in the next 30 days it's like 80 million something so i mean you know uh, we're, we're talking i, I about... wouldn't say i wouldn't say it's oh it's blown you know i i i wish these type of news would get as, as much 
coverage as this all no, of them. No, for sure. But I would say it's nothing compared to 2008 yeah. crisis. 2008 crisis was a systematic crisis. In te- we, we get to uh, another person who I connected to that, but that was a systematic crisis and I'll get to that. Yeah, but, unless uh, this is also a system and there are more of these and there are more of these, is- then sure. That's different. No, no. That's the thing. That's, I would say, that's right. That the, the idea, these people who talk about like China is a communist country or China is a state planned and uh, like there won't be a problem and all that. I would say like, again, China, just like US, everything is a Ponzi scheme right now. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're going to see a lot of more of that coming out of China and a lot of other places. And I, I assume they're going to come up with some restructuring program. And, you know, but yeah, I do think we're going to see a lot more of this. But I don't think this is the same level of crisis event, uh, crisis level event as uh, uh, 2000. Yeah, 100%. I mean, un- unless seven, there's much more to it, unless there's there are layers and layers and layers that we haven't talked about. Anything, uh, I, right I don't think Evergrade is as exposed as the housing market was. And anyway, the 2008 financial crisis, there were a few issues that, that there wasn't also just one. There were like a few that kind of led oh, to each other. There were, there it, were some one or two primary, no, but no, it, it wasn't it, like it, one thing. I think they try to over, they try to over, uh, complicated okay. it was basically a housing market mm-hmm. that due to due to neoliberal policies and derivative and shorting yeah. and uh, shorting on shorting and all that had exa- exasperated yeah but, no but i agree the fundamentals of it was pretty yeah no i agree it's just that it was kind of involved from two or three um, angles but yeah exactly it, it was all around the housing market i mean yeah i'm not yeah, yeah. that's one way of explaining for okay. sure but okay yeah um continue what else oh uh well yeah and david harvey who's a um famous british marxist he has one of the in my <sighs> view okay the, well, i'm just looking I'm just you know looking. the guy continue. who has that youtube animation thingy that explains 2007 2008 oh crisis. yes i know him um he he also goes on that channel that Richard Wolf has, um, Richard Wolf's channel, whatever it's called, yeah, and, and on there he tells like Marxist stories and stuff, yeah, history, yeah. Sorry, he has a podcast, the uh, Anti Capitalist Chronicles or something. Uh, it's a really good one, and I think he he has a couple of good stuff on China. I'm not even gonna try to rephrase or summarize his. Mm-hmm thinking and thoughts because i don't get them and by the way i i mean are we i just was thinking right now we couldn't remember exactly the ratican's point of view and all that i feel like we are we might be either slow or consuming way too much and it's just all becoming a blur <laughs> but yeah uh, but he does great stuff about the um economic situation right now i, I highly recommend everybody checking that out no, he definitely, he's a democracy, democracy at work. That's what it's called. The channel that Richard Wolf is associated with. So he, he, he uploads new content there too, if anybody's interested. And, and he has a, he has a class thing. It's free. Like you can, I think, listen to lectures for free. Reading Marx with David Harvey, oh, nice. which is uh, much better than reading Marx alone. <laughs> for sure you definitely need uh, you definitely need someone to translate marxism into english like <laughs> he doesn't well, write in yeah, english then, <laughs> or in german it's just his own language he came up with and decided <laughs> well yeah. to publish <laughs> no goddamn examples man if he just gave up on the goddamn <laughs> you see if you go to a german forest <laughs> and then cut the wood Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah. Him, it's really funny. Adam Smith and Karl Marx, although they like complete opposites, apparently, although if you read the original text, yeah. not that. Yeah. But, but their way of writing, very similar, just constant anecdotes. And mm-hmm. although Marx has more academic rigor, but it's just these fucking anecdotes. <laughs> God yeah. Damn it. But no, definitely, that's a good shout out there. 
And then if you don't have anything else to say about David Harvey, I believe you also wanted to mention John Stewart has a new show. Um, you were telling yeah, yeah. me. Yeah, so I know you're a bigger fan than him. My parents used to watch him. I used to watch him a little bit here and there, but, you know, not really. I love that. Like, <laughs> uh, people of above a certain <laughs> age, I, my taste and just, <laughs> oh, uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's a bit of, uh, I, I do feel, I love uh, John Stewart. He's even his most recent appearance before the one this week, the one before on Colbert report i think he's just one of the funniest men i keep re-watching his 1999 2000 daily shows uh, just because i like to see history as it is like when mm-hmm. you did when i did history at university you had to read stuff like from that day and anyway it's good but uh, uh, it's a bit worrying though because after trump and russia gate a lot of people's brains broke and for example i never really liked personally i was never a huge fan he does a great work he's far more talented and successful than i am but i personally never really enjoyed john oliver's show but i got i felt i get some information or something but after trump and russiagate everything became a bit uh, tainted and you couldn't really get away from it so I, 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 in a way, I was so happy that John Stewart quit The Daily Show right before that. Uh, so now him, him coming back, part of me is so happy because uh, I think he was always, he was not as funny as Colbert in my view necessarily, but he was always so good in his analysis and all that. Uh, so that makes me happy, so- but... I, I'm worried about the whole Trump and Russia gate. In my view, some people feel Trump is such a threat that they focus solely on that. And for me, that's tiring. Not to say that Trump and fucking yeah. no fascists and they're not a threat. It's just I would like I used to watch Daily Show because they focused on something new. And yeah, anyway. But yeah, no, but no. I'm very enough. happy right now. But so, just <laughs> just one question for you then. So, was he, he wasn't on TV during this whole time while Trump was in while Trump was in office, or he was? He came on a few. He he, he did some political work for uh people for nine eleven uh, firefighters and. But he I didn't have his own show friends. really during that whole time. But, no, but he did direct. Uh, he he. By the way, he's directed a movie about Iran called Rosewater, uh, and he also directed the, another movie with uh, Steve Carell and um, uh, and okay. Rose Byrne. A lot of famous. We, we, maybe we can review that. It's a very political movie. It's about a, a sort of a tiny tiny uh, election uh, uh, that goes sort of national. Although I I. I mean, I love John Stewart again with all due respect. Uh, it was a good movie, the acting fantastic, but in my view, the movie could it couldn't balance the line between being a laugh out out satire that sort of goes completely mental and be having a message and being realistic. So it's uh, like Rose Byrne, I think is fantastic. Uh, Steve Carroll, as always, just amazing. But just this, the it's just the messaging doesn't work. Uh, again, with all due respect, he's like one of the people who's again uh, uh, helps. Like I, my political awakening, let's say. Mm. Or oh, I see. Okay. All right. Very nice. So um, I just really hope Trump hasn't broken <laughs> him. Like again, yeah. I fucking hate Trump, but we can do other stuff. Yeah, no. Okay, so hopefully, yeah, Trump hasn't broken <laughs> John Stewart. And so, yeah, I'm excited not that, for you when that by comes By the way, <laughs> not that I'm, I'm like this fucking judge yeah. of who gets... Yeah, I mean, I know how... Mm-hmm. How, uh, I don't know, pomp, pompous I sound. Anyway. But okay. All right, nice. Good stuff there. So um, should we move... Just talk about Elizabeth Holmes very quickly. No, nothing really to talk about. I mean, it's not necessarily well, yeah, a progressive, nothing specific. I mean, it's not necessarily a 
progressive issue either or not at all. It's kind of almost apolitical. I think that makes it very juicy. But Breaking Points have been co- have been covering it. And right now, Elizabeth Holmes is going through a trial. But right before we talk about this, I just thought I'd explain who Elizabeth Holmes is for anybody who happens not She's to be familiar. She's the granddaughter of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, I was going to get to that. But... I mean, honestly, if you don't know about it, you should go and I'll tell you the name of the podcast and listen to it. It's just the funnest thing. But pretty much this young lady was born in Washington, D.C. in 1984, right? She, I guess she was kind of smart a little bit or whatnot. Well-off family. Her dad worked in different um, government agencies. Her, Her mom worked in Congress. She was a Congress staffer. And she goes to Stanford University And just after two semesters at the age of 19, she decides to drop out to pursue her her startup, her full-time startup, right? And what was this about? She had this imaginary, well, now we know, imaginary product idea. And even back then, it didn't exist. So instead of for you to run blood tests, you would have to take, like, you know, however they do it now, they remove quite a bit of blood and have to get it through your veins and stuff. She was like... Wouldn't it be amazing if you could do that from just like one drop of blood from your finger? Like, yeah, sure. I'm sure that that is amazing. A lot of things are amazing. But so she pretty much started this company. Then in the next 15 years, she became a billionaire and it was all based on nothing. They never managed. She became a billionaire? Yeah, at one point, she was the youngest like woman self-made billionaire based on the shares of Theranos. Uh-huh. Based on the shares of uh-huh. theirs, kind of like so how most com- a lot. No, no, but yes, but that's yes, how we talk com- about Jeff Bezos and Elon yeah, Musk Bezos. too. So yeah, yeah but, based but, on that, she but, was a billionaire. Uh, I, I, but I genuinely thought she went millionaire, like multi-millionaire, like hundreds. Yeah. But I didn't think billion. Wow. No, okay. she was considered her- a billionaire, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, the product didn't exist from the beginning. It is a great idea. But and she tried to will it into reality. And you'll see, like we're going to talk about now, she does obviously have some skills which make her too good of a con artist for her own good. If she was a bit less skilled, she wouldn't she wouldn't be facing 25 years in jail right now. Because, I mean, this 19 year old girl. Okay, now we can now we can start talking about I'll just finish this. This 19 year old girl. Oh, it collected hundreds of millions of dollars in investment within a few years from some of the biggest investors in the U.S. So we can't even talk about who specifically. So, yeah, that's why um, that's why I said that. Sam. No, I would say if she was actually smart, she would have uh, moved to a country without extradition. And that's it. Dubai. Well, I mean, I, I, I think Dubai, they were, I think she. I think she just believed too much in her own bullshit and thought that she was going to oh, get out she of actually, this. I, I mean, I, don't I mean, know, it's crazy, right? She, just think about somebody, it. She was somebody 19. Who changes their voice or, yeah. and goes with a Kermit. Hello. Oh, so hello. this is how hello. fake that she is. So Sam is referring to the no, no, fact so, that based on videos and everything, she changed her story. voice. To sound like more of a serious person, she was obsessed with Steve Jobs, so she started dressing like Steve oh, Jobs. Turtlenecks, yes, and turtlenecks. Yeah, or she was all about the optics. I mean, they go and buy and they go and rent out Facebook's old headquarter and move there. Like a lot of money was shuffled. I mean, just listen to this, investors, right? I love. Just listen to this. The Walton family gave 150 million. Rupert Murdoch gave 120 million. Betsy Devos, 100 million. The Cox family, Cox Media Group, 100 million. I mean, she just got money out of these people for 15 years now, based on nothing. I feel, a, yeah, ba- right now I'm feeling like, yeah, I feel like she, she's the good guy right now after <laughs> telling the people she's ripped off. Although, again, if she had ripped them off, if she had ripped them off for, like, let's say a glass or something that doesn't, like, I don't know. I don't know if anybody took, did she ever produce a product that was Yeah, so let me tell you. So she never, no, no, no. 
what she's what she was telling everybody for 15 years is that wouldn't it be amazing if there was a little box that could just take one drop and run a bunch of tests no so, but was it ever so let me tell you somebody... let me tell you let me tell you i'm telling you so the closest thing that they reached they actually had made a deal with walgreens nobody else believed them but walgreens which is a pharmacy they that's the closest yeah, that they got one. and in fact they had them they put their machines in or like they would take blood from them in Walgreens and then send it. So they did dissect like the blood of people, some from Walgreens and some in the testing period. But based on all the people who've come out, they never were able to run <laughs> these tests on their own machines. So like when the when the blood would come into their labs, they would like run one test on one machine, then run another test on another machine. So, wait. And on top of that, it was full of mistakes full of mistakes happened so the short answer uh, is that they they never made a product they made like you know like would be versions of it barely being held together with tape yeah, but yeah. some people apparently like i can no, tell you yeah i can wait, tell you uh, more stories so you you, you see the but machines no. the machines where they the machines where the first strap whatever machines were they sold to people or were they used at the Walgreens? Um, I, they, they were not, they were never sold By, to people. They were not sold to people. The or only in thing, a way then she feels like a folk hero now. She's like Robin Hood. What do you mean? In a way. Why? Like, well, like she ripped off Rupert Murdoch and yeah, I mean, she ripped was. off. What yeah. was she going to do? Like fund some Christian schools where they rape children? Yeah, I mean oh, okay. that's not okay. I mean, if another... it was, I I thought it's people, true. I thought I thought people like got, for example, they did that thing and the thing said, yeah, I don't know. Oh, no, 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 that happened too. To hospital. But the device wasn't that. Oh, good. The device was never supposed to be that good. Like the results weren't going to be done immediately. Anybody the only thing got that they changed. Damaged. Yeah, so people got a bunch of false results from Theranos. People thought their tumor had come back. People thought their their cancer Shit. had come back. But those stories cancer aren't that many. Got- yeah, those stories aren't that many. And the reason I said it's a it's not the worst story because since they barely managed to make a product, right? They barely like affected some patients. But yeah, tests were like tests were carried out where, you know, people volunteered and all that, they all went wrong, I mean, trials. And to Walgreens, they actually rolled it out for, they, they fake sure, rolled it right. out, right? Like, yeah, they were doing the tests Test on other pilot. machines. Yeah, and, you know. No, but a uh, question. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they, it was supposed to tell you your blood type or it was no, supposed no, no. to tell you it was... if you have cancer, and if you have blood? You know, right now, if you go and do a blood test, they tell you, a lot of things from just doing a blood test her idea was depending on the blood test her yeah. idea was that for sure they would do all of these and more all of these amazing blood test results from just one drop of blood from your finger oh so instead of you yeah. going have to give out a lot of blood and stuff you just pass by all right. the machine at anybody Walgreens. got hurt in the end by the way, anybody um, that cares in the end by like mixed by mistaken transfusion or mistaken uh, organ organ transplant? No, because I mean, I guess people had there. There are some human stories in the podcast, and the podcast is really amazing to listen to. Is the dropout by ABC? It's really fun. And um, most people went and got other tests. After a while, they found that. But you know, there's this one person she um, she talks I suppose, about. But yeah, thankfully. They, uh, yeah. I mean, if nobody yeah, she, got financially or physically hurt, I would say no. Yeah, that's least why she the, got some money off of some of the worst people on earth, like Betsy DeVos. Yeah, I mean, she, uh, she but, wasted their yeah. money, but I mean, she ruined a lot of people who work for her. I mean, it's full of staff um, stories of all these well, people. She who, hired them first. What do you who, mean? Who, ruined who I don't. Money? Yeah, I mean, no. Afterwards, what when they would mean? when they would well, complain okay, about something, then they were set. They were putting people behind them to go after them, suing people, what? all kinds of things. Yeah. Really? Going, suing them. Yeah. Spying on people. This one person switched jobs and was working somewhere else and they were still sending people to, to threaten them. Is that legal? 
what the fuck no is i mean she's been she's been charged a bunch of times this is now she's been charged under multiple things no, and I now there's this long trial going down fraud. but not, well, is that part of her charges like they i don't know if that is part like of her charges so you have to listen to the podcast yeah that's like one of the main part that she was like this horrible person the next per- and the person that you kind of brings in so her I, lover I genuinely he was on top I of it about- But you have to go listen to the podcast. And man, the people, though, I don't believe how she conned these people. And I mean, one person, she was just really good at it. The former secretary of state. Oh, no, she threatened people. And I mean, that. I mean, that's based on all the stories. But no, I mean, like threatening them with lawsuits and being sued and this kind of way. Oh, okay. That's yeah. yeah. Okay. No, and like people actually coming after people. No, in that way, legally. And like one of her biggest supporters was George Schultz, okay. who was the Secretary of State under Reagan for six years. He's like one of the main people that who went sense. and got all these investors. And he's his grandson was one of the main whistleblowers. So, and then <laughs> the grandson actually his her, her grand his he's grandpa George what? Schultz. On the bush. On yeah, the bush he went and worked technology? there for two months, and he came back and told his grandpa, "Is like, listen." All these things that Elizabeth has been telling us. You know what they were doing? The grandpa, he said that, no, I was tested on it and it works. But they would take his blood the traditional way, go run tests and come back. And then (laughs) the grandson told him, he's like, but you yourself, it didn't work on you, the machine. He's like, no, no, it's one. I'm like a rare incident you don't know this is being used everywhere it's being used on helicopters by on u.s helicopters yeah, in afghanistan I, I, and you, iraq like yeah i i can imagine a lot of boomers getting yeah. trapped by but, boomers used to think future is like going to be like jetsons <laughs> like me yeah. so you know they can see that type of shit to, to them it seems real i would say reagan famously said trees cause pollution so you know <laughs> Yeah, well, Again, I mean, these, these people are very scientifically minded. But Sam, you have to listen to the podcast. It's just so funny. You know, she but, had like Henry Kissinger on say, her on her board. Yeah, these yeah. people are be idiots. Fair, I mean, they're idiots. You know, Henry Kissinger, from what I understand, didn't invest. Henry Kissinger is Was on smart the board. enough to get money. money. He, he gets money to yeah. provide, to provide, usually he gets money to provide some form of like prestige. And then just uh, yeah, no, that's exactly away. what he did. But I would say, uh, yeah, that, that usually is uh, the, his whole lemon bread. <laughs> he used to have by them. Oh. They they turn out well, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, I if she only legally threatened people, and if she all she did. But was, anyway, just was don't get boss, stuck up on that. No, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, no, they were. It, no, it, it was like it's much more serious smart... than that. It's it was a medical, it's a medical product, and they uh, were like no. they weren't listening to but, any of the complaints, of course, coming up from any of the scientists because the, they, the, med- the product is not product, working. That what didn't get approved by anybody. That was never approved by anyone to a certain extent. Say, although, although did they, they? I mean, it did go through the trials to different trials yeah, so it worked, reached people yeah, like and that failed. and to walgreens yeah and it failed well it failed based on lies though it, it didn't fail in the sense that they were testing whether it worked or not yeah, they were like was, pretending yeah, that was, it was yeah. working like they were because at the same time she makes it you can they make it about, seem I, like it's such a like a insane product but you know like she sold it as if i'm sure people who give yeah, blood I, a lot they would love it if the process was easier. But at the same time, if you think about it, it's not even that much of a revolutionary product. Whatever the service that she was offering is already done. No, if it can, she just had this your blood imaginary blood way trigger. of it being done quicker. Yeah, no, no. Look, I'm not saying what she did was right or anything, but first of all, it seems she's ripped off some of the worst people on earth. Yeah, yeah, sure. That part, I, yeah, I, I, I'm glad yeah, about yeah. Second, secondly, it doesn't seem from what I understand, if it has led to deaths or some form of human injury, of course, what the fuck? Uh, thirdly, if she, uh, I just think any hedge fund, you can pretty much say the same thing. They're selling this imaginary future 
to their or religions you know like yeah what sure i mean said, yeah. yeah the only mistake she t- made was not run away quick enough it seems that's <laughs> no no only, that's not the mistake that she made mistake. no 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 you know that's far from the crucial and yeah i agree with what you said and the trial is not about her having killed anyone is about um, having committed know. fraud I, I really don't know it's about having about this matter committed fraud but i'll tell you what's the biggest mistake that she made the biggest mistake that she made was the fact that she made herself like so narrow by picking this specific product yeah. and from yeah, the beginning pushing this part such a because, scientific yeah because you know she went and hired she, she somehow got so much money she went and hired people from apple And like, so these top, top people in the industries. So if you would have just told all these people, go make something, (laughs) they would have made something. Her problem is that she kept on pushing this one particular product that's also a medical one. So they were stuck. Yeah, exactly. I don't understand why she went such a down. Because she was 19. Scientific growth. (laughs) Because well, she was 19 she have, and at the I age know, of 20, maybe, they gave her hundreds yeah. of millions. There was no going back. Yeah, but, <laughs> no, well, I don't know. But maybe she, she could have gone the, down the group route, you know, the Gwyneth Paltrow website. Like, <laughs> oh, I don't know, these is like you put these app. stones on I'm you just and it balances an your four humors and blah, yeah. blah. And you make so much money. You don't need FDA approval or anything. Yeah. And whoever says you're saying bullshit, you say, well, it's a spiritual. I mean, fun she's trend. probably going to do yeah. that next. Mindfulness. She's, a, she's probably going to do that next. I mean, right now, ahead of her trial. If, if she gets out of jail. <laughs> she's engaged and married to a huge hotel heir who is 10 years younger than her. So she knows what she's doing in life. And she just got pregnant. Wow. And now she's in court pregnant. And a lot of well, people are saying that is. Her boy is her husband i forced her into this or something that was one of her defenses yeah, that's it? one of her that bullshit you're... things but that's a partner who came in three years after but now since oh, then, this is a different you no know, and that person's on trial is going to be on trial next ramesh sunny balwani and they were going to go on trial together Ra- but oh, she managed Ram- she sounds managed, iranian no he, he indian pakistani indian? background okay but the reason that they separated their trials is exactly she's gone around i mean her team has is arguing that he was abusive and she's saying that if she sees him in the same court she'll have ptsd like uh, so she can't I but don't know. maybe that's what she's saying but yeah it's insane but yeah so now she's also pregnant from her new husband and boyfriend is an uh, extremely rich person and many people think that of course she wanted to get pregnant this time because it's going to look much better in the in the jury's That's eyes true. yeah and she had time to, she got delayed her court case got delayed a few times because of covid so she could have easily planned it if that was her that was her case but she's just it's just so funny the people I, I, who are involved are so funny how much of a bullshit how all of her defenders like you know these relatively like rich and like people who worked for her and stuff they're like this product wouldn't be so amazing she's gonna revolutionize it and all that and nobody How old thinks is she, by the way now and now she's 37 nobody would ask her they're like okay you don't have the technical skills to develop this where's your partner who is the inventor you know okay you're the business guy where's your partner who's that would be my Man. first question and there are people who told her that so in the podcast there are some people who like she came up to a scientist and we told her well that's not doable that doesn't exist like <laughs> have you created <laughs> that <laughs> or not <laughs> it's, it's a great idea but yeah. have you done it or not so yeah the, it's called what we call in the scientific community a miracle it's <laughs> gonna happen but yeah uh, I would say, uh, uh, what was I going to say? She's. Um, I don't know. Sorry, talk yeah. too much. I get really excited with this story because it's no, just no, she's so funny. Fascinating. Uh, yeah, I need to look into the details. I hope I'm not defending her for no reason. I'm not meant to defend her. No, but, but uh, it is. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's just, I'm not even defending her. It's just, <laughs> it's one of those, yeah, really, uh, what the fuck? Like, uh, yeah. It's just so super. Uh, as you say, it's just crazy. No, you're right. Yeah, I mean, she she defrauded like a bunch of. 
honestly, the biggest victims here, the people who I would feel the worst, the most kind of, I would say, okay, yes, there are some people who whose blood results came and they were like completely wrong. And, you know, they went into a huge panic, but hopefully once they did their blood test the conventional way, things were better for them. So she definitely hurt people that way. Then the other ones are these kind of, naive no, I scientists that i would hard. say some of them are young oh. naive scientists who who joined the company and it really uh, seems like the company was a you know they were just they were just trying to fake and make and bullshit and threaten their way through this know, this really seems like paid, what they didn't did they? yeah they yeah no i know but minimum wage yeah no but i'm saying so, but still and then when people left and you know they were still going after them, asking them to sign non-disclosure. I didn't say it's the worst. I was saying the other victims at a certain level are uh, no, people no, but they are who not, work there and they're no, caught up in that, in that shitty are, kind of work environment. They're not victims. They're not I didn't victims. say they're the they biggest suck. victims, they, but it's a shitty not thing. Biggest. Not biggest. They, are not, they saw a gravy train. They got on that gravy train. They drank from that gravy train. And when it was over, they got off it. Some of them, yeah. where I would agree with you, some of the scientists had the had the backbone, had the had the principal. Yeah. They were principled enough to keep saying that no, we are not going to continue on this gravy train and tell people it's possible when it's not. Yeah. But being, but there none of them are victims. Yeah, to a certain extent, to a certain extent, I think they are given like the work situation that it was in. You know, they maybe they should have known. I don't better know. Was she joining. abusive? Was she physically? Yes, exactly. Was I she, mean, sorry, verbal. not physically. Yes, verbally and apparently, and the way that they threatened them. And sorry, a lawsuit oh. from a huge company okay. is much sorry. worse. My, my I would bad. say. I'm. I'm saying a lawsuit by a huge company is much more threatening than your boss shouting at you. I would be much more scared if if a huge company is no. coming after me with a lawsuit than oh, sure. my boss shouting oh, yeah, at yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's worse than shouting. I don't really yeah, yeah. that but, distinction. But, but it's still. But it's still. It's. But I don't know. Let me tell uh, you. Let me say something lost. that will help your point. Let me say something that will help your point. This one professor who worked at Stanford walked by her building a few times just on his way to work. And then he starts reading the name. He's like, Theranos. What is this? He just catches attention. Theranos. He goes home, does a little Google. This is this is what all of these people should have thought. Does a little Google and sees, oh, wow, this they're claiming that this company has made this product. This is amazing. Okay, let me go find the peer-reviewed papers <laughs> done on this. He just starts Googling and he's like, he couldn't find one single study that was done on this and that's how it's product. all unravels so and then he went and you know talked to them and like oh no let's do it let's do a paper together and he never hears back but yeah i mean i think everybody should have that should have been their first kind of reaction but so you're right in that sense but once they were there i mean i'm just saying they're victim no, in no, that no. sense I, I, I but yeah i agree again, they're not huge again, victims no 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 i think she did a very shitty thing i hope people do not defraud even financially like okay even horrible people know. so yeah you're right she took money i don't know from no Murdoch, no actually Betsy i want to watch that back <laughs> i want to watch that back defrauding oh. horrible people may mm. not be a bad thing <laughs> but anyway in this case i don't think she did a thing i'm just saying that a victim who and a, is a bit apparently uh, one of the employees the word, also the committed vic- suicide if i'm not mistaken a senior oh, colleague yeah all right wait wait, yeah. wait wait if if there were verbal abuses uh and i don't think lawsuits i don't know but i don't know but anyway I, go I listen to, to the two that. seasons oh, yeah. we can talk about it yeah, some more shit. but yeah Sorry, one of the that, senior ones i don't know um, I, apparently yeah, I, committed I may suicide have spoken now I, I remember his without story. Without knowing too much. Don't worry about it. Now I remember kind of his story. To I punish him, he was one of the lead scientists and they had downgraded him while keeping his pay, I believe, to going through CVs of new employees coming in. So this was like, and this person, I believe, he ended up um, committing suicide, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Or he passed away. Was He's there, in the store. Was there, was there verbal or physical altercations or they just sort of passive aggressively 
I guess just the way they treated him and with his career and stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't remember the details of like how. No, I need to. <laughs> how, yeah, how we need were. to watch. And that is only part of the story, anyway. I know you're getting kind of fixated on how she, how no, she ran it I feel, in that way. Yeah, yeah, no, no, because I feel like victim. The word victim. Sometimes I don't know about this case at all. Uh, disclaimer, uh, but sometimes it's been thrown around, uh, but liberally. But yeah, I mean, right. at the end, it's just to bear so in mind what that you're telling the me company Sherlock Holmes's <laughs> descendant is not quite as yeah. smart as he yeah, is. exactly. But go watch, go listen to the podcast ABC Dropout. It is really fun, and again, it is fun because not too many people got hurt. Really, that's the that's the thing, and you just laugh about like kind of investors and stuff how they were oh, they yeah. were defrauded and the things that they believed and just the bullshit story that she says and you know just every level is fake you know she has these two dogs you, who are these hold on. Just, she has two dogs that are uh, huskies and she went around telling people that they're wolves and like they're like no these are huskies and she was like no, no. <laughs> like these are wolves you know and so uh, she was just and like a con- straight up liar. <laughs> she, she just a straight up denied reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she denied reality. Uh, man, you really, I think, need to watch. Uh... <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> you really need to watch Succession, I think. Okay. okay. TV show. Yeah. All right. Yeah, no, you told me that I definitely should. It does sound like fun. But okay, Sam, we'll come back to Elizabeth Holmes when there are developments. Apparently, Kissinger and others are going to be talking at her trial. <laughs> they've been they've been called up. Kissinger, so, he yeah. to advise. And Murdoch, like sorry. Murdoch Kingdom. and Kissinger are on the witness list. Oh. Well, so, Murdoch is a... F- yeah. So a maybe once you've listened to, the, listened to the podcast, we can also come back to it. But okay, Sam. Let's wrap up this show with two quick progressive tweets. Are you ready? So the first one, I already know, before you go off into your tangent about the person who made the tweet, that wasn't my intention. So first, let's talk about something else and then we'll go into that. But I took this screenshot from Kyle Kalinske's video and Kyle Kalinske pretty much posted that. Okay, so um, what's his name? Oh my god, Dave Andrew Biden. Yang. Andrew Yang. Sorry, Andrew Yang has announced oh, that he sorry. has a third party. He's creating a third party, and at the same time, he's released his book. So, according to Dave Weigel, right? According Weigel, to him, Weigel, Dave Weigel. I think these are. I think according to Dave Weigel, here are the six planks of the forward party. So his party. So then again, this is about him, and I mean they have to be two of like the most stupid as three of them are just ridiculous so the first one is ranked voice voting and open primaries no. i'm sure a lot of people um support that then fact-based four governance are bullshit fact uh, in based, my view four of them are. yeah fact-based governance means absolutely nothing human-centered uh, capitalism some people are really nice and interpret this as socialism i think they're being oh, way too off. nice seriously effective and modern government jesus christ ubi of course grace and tolerance so you're right there are four which one is the worst there i mean unless if grace this guy, and tolerance if By these are the grace. actually word if the if these are the actual words that andrew yang has used in his book this guy is more ridiculous than i thought i mean we gave him a good we gave him like a fair trial too right when when he ran for people can go see our videos yeah. when he first ran for mayor we were super nice like this guy's a bit different so let's just treat him a bit differently maybe yeah, he's yeah, genuine sure. he seems to be different in a bad way if anything <laughs> if anything I if never, anything I if never thought genuine. Uh, to be i don't know maybe i said that but i hope i never thought he's genuine i don't think anybody's genuine you just try to appeal to a certain base but i would say in my view worst one i don't know what's your let's rank them in my view grace and tolerance is the worst because it doesn't even include any uh, vocabulary related to like governments or uh, or or systems or like anything 
uh, tangible. Okay, Grace so I think and tolerance. Fuck off, you piece. Anyway, so I think because of that, exactly, it doesn't make it the worst. Because at least it's not pretending like the other ones, like fact based I mean, government. The- but you're right. Grace and tolerance is just, he's not even pretending. He's just like, man, if those Rainbows are the words he used. And fairies. <laughs> Uh, babies and lollipops. Man. It's like a fucking Rorschach. Uh, Do you think that's resolved. actually the words he used, though? I mean, he put them in quotations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that does that make it better? I, I mean, that that means that he literally took them from the book. I'm guessing. Uh, oh yeah, so, well. The, so well, yes, Andrew far, Yang literally wrote. Is, I'm assuming his book is pretty much as informative as these six bullet points. I, I would imagine effective but, and modern government no you know what Kamiar you know what's the problem uh, with today's government how effective it is <laughs> I hope somebody's brave enough to stand for an ineffective and traditional government you know yeah. I don't want my government to be modern <laughs> man you know- contra- I mean this controversial stance he takes fact no I, I I like my government based on imagination. <laughs> well, what, what happened? What happened to the 60s dream of a imagination? Go- was that the 60s dream? I mean, he's just, he should go, okay. well, no. No, I, he's, I, re- I mean, these six points are really annoying. And if I was him, I would have taken my time with this third party because he tried president, he tried mayor. Now he's, he's trying third party. All of these in two years, he's, he's going to run his- out of... He's going to run out of sham. Just take it. Man, uh, <laughs> space uh, them out at least. Like, how many are you going to do? They, ne- then he can I run for Congress. The, I forget the, the Gambler, I think is the name of the movie. It's not a great movie, but it has a great line, John Goodman in it. He's trying to write this book that the name of the book is called The Forward Party as well. He's trying to get to the what John Goodman in that movie calls Fuck You Money. You get to two, three million dollar. That's fuck you money. You get there, and I, I think he's not quite there. I think nowadays it's probably more around ten to twelve yeah. million. But you get there, and then you get a big house, sort of build a castle type of thing, <laughs> and the money works itself. For for money makes money for itself. So I think he's trying to get to the fuck you money. That, that, That's I think that, his plan. That makes I don't sense. think he's got any. Although I would say there are easier ways, I think, to get. But yeah, this is one way. I mean, he keeps on raising money, selling book, failing for no reason. I mean, the mayor, the mayor run, he 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 shot himself in the foot a lot by just going. That was badly. Yeah, that was crazy. I so I tactically I even badly done. Yeah, but I mean, the, it's meaningless, right? Like in the UK, they're making fun of Keir Starmer for that fourteen thousand word essay. That's about nothing. I, this sounds like it's the same thing. By the way, I've never been to New York, but I have people, friends, and family who live there. And I don't know these people who AOC, who is a sen- senator or a congresswoman. She's a congresswoman. She's a congresswoman, yeah. And this person who ran for mayor, they don't seem to... Uh, like Jewish people in New York, not all of them support <laughs> Israel 24-7. Yeah, yeah, I do. They don't actually like. Uh, I think majority of funding for APAC comes from yeah. Christian communities, not f- from uh, no. like Jewish people in New York not, are not running around worrying about like. Oh my God, he like. I don't understand yeah. this ridiculous pandering that, in my view, like Jewish community doesn't even want because it's a very diverse and very uh, just like any other community. You know, I mean, yeah, exactly. Like and I think people? people told him that they were like, "You're you're going so much on what this one doing? on this one side, it won't even necessarily like bring in the votes that <laughs> you think even, you will, right? Like, it's not like even Israel the can vote people, for you." Yeah, even the Jewish people in New York who cares about the state of Israel more than uh, average person, they still have like like there are plumbing issues mm-hmm. there is the garbage yeah. issue the flood flooding issues in your like there are mm-hmm. there are real issues go, like, i don't anyway no, he so miscalculated that i mean it's unclear if it's because of that he was like one of he like dropped no, no, out so I just early it, but yeah 
No, I, I mentioned this because of recent AOC vote on the president too. thing. Yeah. Like, like I don't like. Who are you pandering to? Yeah. Jewish people are not meeting in a group. Okay, guys, mm-hmm. she said present, so we are yeah. not. Gonna, what do you think is going on? I I don't know. No, exactly. But uh, yeah, man, just, like I don't understand. So ridiculous, it. and I mean, he just rides this UBI thing. He had one good idea, and of course, this UBI thing. You know, it can easily be turned and it's into not a bad even idea. Even good idea. It, it's re, uh, right if you don't ensure that everything else that Basically, is here stays in place. Coupon idea. Yeah, I mean it UBI without. Treatment. You can go. You can Google. Uh, you can YouTube. This is on Milton Friedman about forty years more than. Yeah, 40 years ago, I was saying the same thing on US television. It's basically government coupons. Money is nothing but a, a, since we have fiat money, it's not backed by anything. It's g- government coupon, right? So UBI is basically giving you government coupons so they, they can cut the social services. That's what it is. That's, that, that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that before, like people jump all over us. Yeah, if you gave UBI, it was mm-hmm. and on top of everything that's already there and healthcare and social security and yeah but exactly one reason that other not well-meaning people are enticed by ubi it's like it's a good excuse Create to then cut jobs off. increase wages yeah, yeah no but yeah i'm saying to you know then cut yeah. off other social security or not give medicare for all and healthcare. so i'm not saying andrew yang's idea is that but also ubi needs more discussion but given that <laughs> he wrote four like absurd points we can't really discuss ubi or the it's, fact that he uh, also suggests ranked choice voting and open primaries which um you know, is far from being a horrible he, idea yeah yeah that's a good idea but but i would say maybe the reason why i personally at least feel somewhat really angry about this is that yeah, as you said, he seemed like, even if you disagree with him, he seemed like a genuine person. And now four of these six points are literally the most disingenuous politician yeah. talk. Uh, okay. Right, right. Grace, like- grace and tolerance. So, by the way, should we tolerate a serial killer? I mean, when you speak this vaguely, you know, yeah. you uh, idiot. Anyway. No, he's setting the bar very low. He's Yeah. But anyway, let's move on. Maybe in his book, he didn't write it this way. This is based on that guy. Oh, do you want to do you want to talk about Ben Weigel, Weigel before we move on to our last tweet? Do you have anything Dave, to say about uh, him? Dave, I have no idea who he is. As I said, I took he, this from Kyle. He writes for Washington Post. And uh, again, people like... Uh, I think he's a very dishonest writer, especially when it comes to the left. He's written, he had a big back, not so much back and forth, pretty much sort of Jimmy Dore a year ago destroyed, in my view, showed that he's a very much of a dishonest actor. And he's very, uh, yeah, in, he's very much had the similar trouble many had with Jimmy Dore when uh, they attack him and then he points out their hypocrisy and then they stop sort of responding. Mm. And uh, he, he writes, for example, I think the, may, may, the substance of the matter is that he writes for Washington Post but does not admit that Washington Post uh, is biased due to, due to the fact that it receives funding from Jeff Bezos. Interesting. Okay, I see. Yeah, I didn't just know that Just to story. be clear, just to be clear, I, I don't mean to say Jeff Bezos comes into Washington Post and runs the office every day, but I believe he's indirectly, partially owner of Washington Post. Yeah, yeah. Partially no, or wholly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he was the owner, but yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. He doesn't send around emails telling people what to write, but typically if you work at a workplace, you understand the sentiment and which way the wind is blowing. Like, yeah, that, that's typically but, how it but, works if you understand your uh, workplace. But to be fair to him, I would say I have seen before this whole debacle and all that. He 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 seemed to be one, like Ryan Grimm, one of the few people that is very well connected and understands uh, Washington politics. So I don't want to like this is my view. Maybe overall his work is good. I don't know. 
Okay. <clears throat> All right. Fair enough. So, Sam, let's move on to the next tweet. And this one, I got it for you, kind of. Because if anybody's wondering when Nina Turner's going to have her first show on uh, on TYT, well, right I, now she's in the UK. So, I and I don't think it's in my with city. TYT. Yeah. So, this tweet has a lot of good things. Let me start. First, it's liked by Glenn Greenwald and Brianna. And then, yeah, so Nina it's Turner is favorite. sitting there with Jeremy Corbyn. A friend of Sam's, and he's at Brighton. So it just says, "When in Brighton." Friend of Sam's, <laughs> Darvian. I've never met a man, met the man, but yeah, friend but, of Sam's. Yeah, I, I really, don't have much uh, to say yeah. about this tweet, but but you see, for example, because he uh, dresses like a normal person, Jeremy Corbyn, and doesn't do the finger thingy that Clinton and Cameron yeah. do. That's he's not presentable as if yeah. anyway mm-hmm. uh, i'm glad I, I i like both of I these hate that people finger thing. I, I know it's apparently i remember it's apparently psychologically gives the feeling of reassurance to the water anyway uh, uh, i like both of these people i love uh, well not love i like jeremy corbyn more nina turner's recent actions are a bit weird i hope this is not broadcast by the young turks because um or maybe actually maybe i am i hope it is broadcast by young turks and i hope they change and they become a far more lefty uh broadcasting program because jeremy corbyn is a real lefty more even more lefty than uh bernie sanders i just hope like brianna joy gray's interviews They focus on points of contention and the way they can move the discussion forward, especially when left in, is in such a bad place uh, uh, instead of just the conversation that, you know, uh, you're great, I'm great type. Yeah. I just, no. that's the only thing. I I, uh, I agree with you there, but I highly doubt it has anything to do with TYT. She didn't even tag TYT. I think she's just doing her own, own thing. And like I predicted... Oh. My pre- official prediction is that we're barely going to see her on TYT, especially after like the initial first few months. The thing But, is, if you're not a member of TYT, you get uh, a lot less. So I yeah. think maybe she's behind the. Yeah, I mean, clips would have either. emerged. We would have seen. But yeah, we shall see. No, but 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 if TYT as a channel that has five million followers and a company that you know, hires a lot of people that start supporting Jeremy Corbyn likes politicians. That's definitely a good thing. I hope that happens. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Ron Placon recently went on the Vanguard and he did an interview. And for all the people who talk about Bernie bros and aggressive people on the left, like Ron Placon, especially, I like, I love the guy, basically. His demands are just so reasonable. And he puts them in such a reasonable way and he explains them. And it's still like, uh, like they're not even willing to meet him, not halfway, not even, yeah. they're not even willing to meet him 10% of the, ah, it's anyway. But yeah, no, agreed. But okay. So on that note, let's wrap up this episode of the progressive world. Thank you very much for very watching. Please like, and subscribe. And more importantly, leave your comments, questions, and criticisms below. I will make sure to get to them. But yeah, thank you for watching. And we'll see I you next. <laughs> thank you for watching. I will. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.